Hello and good morning. This is Rules for Tomorrow's Lawyers, sponsored by the UP College of Law and the Institute for the Administration of Justice, a symposium on the proposed code of professional responsibility. There will be two parts of this program for this morning. We have lecturers, uh, esteemed lecturers, and in the afternoon, there will be lightning talks from the classes of the UP College of Law. To welcome the participants and to set the theme for the program, please welcome our director, Professor Emerson Espanias. Hello, good morning. Uh, thank you for coming in on a Saturday, uh, early Saturday. Uh, this symposium can be traced to a group chat on the legal profession subject cluster. Uh, one of its members, uh, Professor Fina Tantuico, uh, also happens to be a member of the Supreme Court's uh, Rules Revision Subcommittee, uh, currently working on changes to the Code of Professional Responsibility, which is the, or the CPR, the primary source of ethical guidance for lawyers in the Philippines. Uh, Professor Fina asked members of the cluster to contribute notes on what may need to be changed in the CPR, and uh, it, it really sparked interesting uh, discussions. There are many aspects of the CPR which I think are timeless you know, because they speak to the core of what it means to be a lawyer and the duties that we owe uh, to our larger community uh, as well as our institutions. At the same time, um, the COVID crisis that we grappled with, that we continue to grapple with, has been revelatory. You know, crisis is always, uh, always has a tendency of revealing the nature of things. Uh, it, it rendered in stark terms that some things no longer work and some things need to be changed. Uh, for the past few years you know, alone, uh, we have been forced to rethink what it means to teach the law and what it means to receive a legal education. Uh, we, we now have classes of students which have you know, uh, known only uh, remote legal education. Uh, we have been forced to rethink what it means to take the bar exams. Uh, what it means to appear in court. Right? Uh, I hope that the bout of self-reflection and change uh, will continue. Uh, one useful guide for navigating what may come ahead is, is this work by uh, Professor Richard Suskin. Uh, it's a book called Tomorrow's Lawyers, and it's the obvious source of today's uh, theme. It's a short and accessible work, and I really recommend uh, that everyone check it out. Uh, Professor Suskin points to several trends that can impact the profession. So we have economic developments that require law firms and practitioners to do more with less. Uh, the formation of allied legal professions that carve out auxiliary legal activities. Uh, we are familiar with that here in the UP College of Law. Uh, this very morning, we, shall, we, we are also having uh, uh, a session on the, uh, from the paralegal training program. Right? Uh, and of course, one, one, one trend uh, is the growing sophistication of technologies such as artificial intelligence. Uh, I am particularly interested in in this last one. Uh, and every now and then I, I, I try to check the state of the art. Uh, for now, it is unlikely that robots or would be representing clients in court, uh, not yet. However, uh, the machines are nibbling at the edges, you know, making significant strides uh, when it comes to risk assessment, as well as basic legal research. Uh, this may have consequences for uh, entry-level legal jobs uh, on those who, uh, 
meaning on those who are studying law today and hope to join the profession in the future. So the first part of the symposium, uh, this morning session, will help us situate ourselves you know, about the unique challenges that face the profession as we continue to move forward into the future. On the other hand, the afternoon sessions uh, uh, will be a way of response, will, will come in way of response. Uh, I hope you can join us uh, for those sessions to listen to our students uh, who are in fact tomorrow's lawyers um, as they present their old vision of the changes that we need to make. So once again, thank you everyone. Thank you to our uh, esteemed speakers. Thank you to, to, uh, to, to the staff organizing uh, this event. And thank you to uh, the audience for, for, for attending. Uh, I hope this symposium is, you know, uh, is only the start of a longer discussion that we need to have on the future of the, of the profession as well as the future of the CPR. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Banyes. <clears throat> and now to give uh, opening remarks from uh, Professor Edgardo Carlo L. Vistan, the Dean of the UP College of Law. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this symposium entitled Rules for Tomorrow's Lawyers. The world has changed significantly since the ethical canons that Filipino lawyers live by were codified as the present code of professional responsibility. As we emerge from a pandemic that saw the administration of justice and the practice of law severely disrupted and even grounding to a halt at times with resulting hardships befalling those who needed legal protection and assistance, it appears that even the concept of professional responsibility needs to be re-evaluated and possibly clarified or enlarged. Developments such as the clinical legal education requirement for all law students, which has allowed them to practice law before admission to the bar, also work to push the question of the adequacy of the code of professional responsibility front and center. The Supreme Court and the legal profession have been addressing the question. As efforts to update the Code of Professional Responsibility gain traction, this timely symposium organized by the UP Law Center's Institute for the Administration of Justice provides stakeholders with an engaging space to suggest and weigh in on possible reforms. We thank the Institute for the Administration of Justice, headed by Professor Emerson Banyas, for this venue to talk about the rules for tomorrow's lawyers. We are also privileged to have very able speakers laying the groundwork for contemplation and discussion. We are very grateful to all of you, our dear speakers, for agreeing to share your experience and insight. Let me conclude this opening message by expressing our gratitude to all our participants for, de for devoting some of your precious weekend time to this morning's discussions. Thank you very much, and I wish you all a productive and pleasant morning. Thank you, Dean Vistan. At this point, I'd just like to remind everybody that if you have questions after the lecture, uh, post them in the Q&A uh, box of the uh, this webinar page. We are also uh, live stream on uh, Facebook. And uh, all your questions will be vetted out and uh, will be announced or read during the plenary discussion. Thank you. Yeah. This point. Uh, to talk on the retrospectives on the last round of changes to the code of professional responsibility. We will be welcoming Professor Concepcion El Haldereza, a professorial lecturer of the UP College of Law. Uh, she obtained her Bachelor of, uh, Bachelor of Arts in Political Science and Law from the University of the Philippines. She teaches legal profession and sales 
and she was officer in charge of the information and publication of the UP Law Center, formerly the college secretary and the director of the evening program, has worked with the UP Law Center in various capacities since 1994 and was the former associate dean. She has also contributed to several law publications. She was an editor of the Philippine Law Report, the ASEAN Law Journal, and other publications of the UP Law Center. She has written on subjects including the Code of Professional Responsibility, the anti bausi Act, the Philippine Judicial System, and Dispute Resolution in the Philippines. Ladies and gentlemen, so all please welcome Professor Concepcion L. Hardilesa to talk on the retrospectives on the last round of changes to the Code of Professional Responsibility. Good morning. My topic for this morning is a retrospect on the last round of changes to the CPR. It is rather difficult to reconstruct an event which happened 40 years ago, but let me just give you a little background on the drafting of the Code of Professional Responsibility based on an article written by Justice Irene Cortez. It was a time when there was so much criticism and prejudices against lawyers. It was more noticeable because of their prominent position and influence in the community rather than their invaluable usefulness. For the legal profession to gain full public respect, it needed to establish a standard of rules for the conduct of its lawyers. The Philippine Bar Association or the PBA, which was founded in 1891, is the oldest voluntary national organization of lawyers in the Philippines. In 1917, it adopted as its own Canons 1 to 32 of the Canons of Professional Ethics of the American Bar Association, or the ABA. In 1946, 29 years later, it again adopted as its own Canons 33 to 47 of the said Canons of Professional Ethics of the ABA. For a number of years, these canons serve as the ethical standards and the guiding principles of conduct in the practice of law in the Philippines. In January 1973, the Supreme Court, by per procurium resolution, ordained the Integrated Bar of the Philippines, or the IBP. The IBP is a mandatory bar association for Filipino lawyers whose names appear in the role of attorneys of the Supreme Court. One becomes a member of the IBP when she passes the bar examination. Presently, there are about 78,000 active members of the IBP. Upon its integration in 1973, Justice Jose B. L. Reyes was elected its first president. The second president was attorney Liliano Neri. In 1977, Justice Marcelo Fernan became the third president of the IBP. It was during the term of Justice Fernan when the IBP Board of Governors created the National Standing Committee on Professional Responsibility, Discipline, and Disbarment as provided for in its bylaws. The committee was charged with the task of reviewing the canons of professional ethics adopted by the PBA in 1970, and again in 1946, and thus formulating an updated code of professional responsibility considering developments in the Philippines and in other jurisdictions. The committee had its working members the following, Justice Irene Cortez as chairperson, who was at the time the Dean of the UP College of Law, Judge Carolina Guino Aquino, who went to the Supreme Court, practicing lawyers, Marcelo Fernand, then IPP president also, and later went to the Supreme Court, President Gon no, Gonzalo Gonzalez, he passed away, and Camilo Quiazon, who also went to the Supreme Court. And from the academe, Professor Jose Felix Espinosa and Carmelo B. Season. Two retired justices of the Supreme Court, former Chief Justice Roberto Concepcion and former Justice J.B. L. Reyes, active as, acted as consultants 
um, an extended to the committee the benefit of their expertise, experience, and moral leadership. Both were always present in the working sessions and actively took part in the shaping of the code. The arms, three arms of the legal profession were represented, the bands, the bar, and the academe. Two resource persons from the UP Law Center assisted the committees were Professor Mirna Feliciano and myself. We sold to it to secure the materials and research as requested by the members, the recording of the consensus reached during the committee's meeting and took the responsibility of supervising the reproduction and distribution of the drafts. The proposed code was the result of one and a half year of study, research, reflection, and discussion of cooperative efforts. At the initial session, the scope of the committee's assignment was assigned. The committee discussed the general guidelines, adopted a timetable, divided the subject of the professional responsibility into four categories, and formed a working committee to conduct the project. After the first organizational meeting, is of these meetings involved working sessions at which members of the committee deliberated on the materials and drafts distributed beforehand for their analysis and evaluation. The committee began its work by examining the canons of professional ethics, the American Bar Association Code of Professional Responsibility, the Canadian Bar Association Code of Professional Conduct, and the other literature on the subject. Two options were open. One, to adopt in full the ABA Code of Professional Responsibility of 1970, and in much the same way that the Philippine Bar Association adopted in 1917. And again, in 1946, the 1908 ABA Canons of Professional Ethics. This would have required no more than a straightforward proposal to the effect that the IBP adopts and makes its own the Code of Professional Responsibility of the ABA. But the committee opted for another alternative. It was unanimous, deci unanimously decided that the proposed code should consider the environment of the legal profession in the Philippines and should therefore examine the provisions or of similar codes and canons governing the legal profession in other jurisdictions only to determine whether they also would have any applicability in this country. The proposed code is divided into four chapters. Each chapter governs a particular area in which the activity of a lawyer gives rise to professional responsibility, namely the lawyer and society, the lawyer and the legal profession, the lawyer and the courts, the lawyer and the client. Each chapter consists of canons numbered consecutively, and there are 22 canons in all. Each of the canons is divided into specific rules. It provided for concrete grounds for disciplinary actions against an erring lawyer. It is fair then to say that any member of the profession having, having some ethical problem will receive helpful guidance if the material is thoroughly read and applied to the problem at hand. At this point, I would like to ask you if you still go back and refer to the CPR in case of doubts or anything that you do not know whether it's a misconduct, a violation or nothing more. Um, I require my students in my class to memorize the lawyer's oath and put them not only in their head, but also in their heart. I also remind them that in their actual practice of law later on when they become lawyers, that lawyers will be maybe suffering from an ethical de dilemma and also from an ethical trilemma. The code is limited in scope and nature. It incorporated neither the canons of judicial ethics because there was another committee assigned to work on the canons, and also the procedural aspect of the code because it falls under depending grievance procedure rules 
formulated by the IBP and also to be submitted to the Supreme Court. The proposed code has an its concentric widening circles of areas of the lawyer's relationship. At the center is the lawyer himself. Immediately around him is the field of the lawyer-client relationship. This goes outwards to the sphere of this relationship of the lawyer to the court, then to the relation of the lawyer to the legal profession, and finally, that of the lawyer and society. The two outermost areas represent the lawyer's public responsibility as distinguished from the private responsibility created by contract or agreement with the clients. The proposed code reduced the number of canons, simplified and systematized the presentation of rules, and underscores the public responsibilities of the lawyer. The committee during the deliberations expressed hope that the code will provide a sound basis for the delivery to the public of competent legal services according to the highest tradition of the profession. So IBP had actually published the proposed code in the newspaper of general circulation. And also uh, since the rules uh, actually that get the professional conduct of lawyers affect the public, they serve, the people have an interest in and deserve to be heard in the process of formulating these rules. This, the rules was initially drafted in 1978 by the IBP called the Professional Responsibility, Discipline and Disbarment. It was submitted to the Supreme Court for approval in 1980. And the CPR was finally promulgated by the Supreme Court on June 21, 1988 eight years after it was drafted. Why did it take so long to be promulgated after it was submitted to the Supreme Court in Bank? Well, there is an anecdote to that a story, but you must remember in 1977, attorney Fernand was appointed pres elected president of the IPP. He actually then created the committee to study on the code. Uh, the committee submitted the draft, the code, to the Supreme Court in 1980. And it was in 1980, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court was Chief Justice Enrique Fernando. Justice Fernando wanted to then create a committee to study the draft of the code. But uh, so he decided that he would just shelve the draft and just forget about it. So in 1988 or some few years back, just Attorney Fernand was appointed to the Supreme Court, and in 1988, he was appointed Chief Justice of the Court. So one day he thought that maybe uh, he would like to take, look over the code that drafted during that was drafted during his time in 1977 as IBP president. He asked for the review, and uh, then he requested the that it be submitted to the Supreme Court in Bank for approval and promulgation. And here it was in January, 20, June 22, 1988. The Supreme Court actually promulgated the code. So it's just a story, it's just an anecdote, but uh, that's the reason why it took it so long. Now, I have some comments as far as this job is concerned. First, it's the Code of Professional Responsibility, which was promulgated in 1988, still relevant after the ruling of the Cayetano versus Consult in 1992 as to the definition of the practice of law. Um, the code, the committee at that time who was working on the code, uh, did not, do not have actually a specific definition of what is the practice of law. But they have in their mind that the practice of law means appearance of a lawyer in a courtroom, which is habitual, and it is actually uh, actual, habitual, and continuous activity. And there is a lawyer client relationship, and this lawyer client relationship, he receives a fee. Now, uh, what happens is that. If you look at the dissenting opinion in the Caetano versus Consol, 
uh, Justices Padilla, Cruz, and Gutierrez also had in their mind how do they find or how do they define the practice of law as a lawyer appearing in court who appears there habitually, the practice is active, and the lawyer receives a fee for his appearance. Now, uh, if we look also at the code, the committee included a separate part of the lawyer and the court. What does this mean? Maybe that they intentionally try to define through the chapter on the lawyer and the court that the practice of law is only limited inside the court room. So enough of Caetano versus Monson, just a food for thought. Now, another comment would be that the code committee borrowed some provisions from the 1970 ABA Code of Professional Responsibility. But since 1970, the ABA Code has gone through several research studies, reviews, revisions, and amendments. The ABA Code of Professional Responsibility is now called the 1984 Model Rules of Professional Responsibility. Now, our CPR borrowed most of its particular provisions from the 1970 ABA Code of Professional Responsibility. So since then, our own CPR has not been visited, revisited at all. Maybe it's also about time that we look into that. But the third one is my comment is that the ABA has what they call a standing committee on ethics and professional responsibility. ABA members or are encouraged to write or to call the committee for opinions on issues of professional conduct, whether this conduct is a violation, whether this is allowed, whether this is a misconduct, or whether it is none. Well, this committee actually oversees the interpretation of professional standards of the association and recommends appropriate amendments and clarifications, issues, opinions, and interprets the model rules of professional conduct. Now, all of these opinions of the committee is published in a series of hardbound volumes coming in together, the compilation of all the issues they have come out after submission from the local ABA chapter to them for comment. Um, this is put together and every like two years when there is a lawyer's convention, they present some of these opinions for discussion, analysis, and maybe hopefully for approval. If this is done this way, we also need to revisit our code of professional responsibility and perhaps create a similar committee that will look into our code of conduct. Well, we should not only do that, but we should also encourage all IBP members to participate, be more active, and be more involved in this particular code of ethics for lawyers and other IBP activities. Finally, uh, my last comment are the new issues and questions raised by the influence first of the technological developments have in the delivery of digital services. Well, the, the internet, um, the search engines, uh, the photocopying, uh, well, those things did not exist at all. It has not existed during the time when we drafted the code. So research was done to a card catalog in the library. Uh, we had to actually photocopy a page and it was so expensive because there was no Xerox machine then. Um, and no computer, no search engines and, and all of these things. Um, so it was entirely a different environment during the time when the code was drafting, doing a research studies uh, on what to do with the canons of professional ethics. Well, the other comment or another new issue is the explosive dynamics of modern law practice. Um, I do not know if this particular group of female lawyers 
companies to exist, but uh, they don't call themselves working together in the firm. But what they do is, maybe I should call them communication lawyers because they do research and write uh, for legislators or an agency who always do come out with a memorandum or a bill and they do study, like maybe if you want to present a bill on women and child, they can help you do the research, uh, write a bill and make comments. Uh, they, they do that. Well, according to them, they do not have any lawyer client relationship, but they just help. So it's, it's not really, I do not know with whether you call that a practice of law because they still apply their knowledge and their expertise and their experience and skills as lawyers. Now, finally, where well, we have the anticipated developments in the future of legal law practice, of course, the future of legal law practice is so different. It was before than it is now. Um, during my time, uh, when we graduate or we pass the bar, uh, our, our friends would ask, uh, where did you apply? Uh, with law firm, big law firm, small law firm, or you just want to be a notary public. Uh, what I mean is there are very little options for us young lawyers who are to look for work. Maybe go into government uh, service, but government uh, lawyers are not highly regarded at that time with a very low salary. Uh, go work with a law firm uh, yes and that is just the practice of law as what we have in mind at the time we do not have the ngos there is that one who practice arbitration there is that one who specializes in women and child um, no one works for a multinational corporation if it is if it is, then we do not yet know whether at that time we call it a practice of law, but so many other things. So uh, hopefully the, the, a group of people here around who would like to study further what to do to present uh, a, 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 during your revisit to the code, uh, put that to, all together and maybe we can entirely come up with a good and new canons or code of professional responsibility. Thank you all and thank you for sitting there and have a good day. Thank you, Professor Concepcion L. Hardilesa, our former associate dean at the UP College of Law, for that discussion on retrospectives and the last round of changes to the code of professional responsibility. Seems that uh, we're actually running early at this point. We'd like to introduce our next lecturer, Attorney Raymond Marvik C. Bagilat, to discuss Ipatulfo Mo, discerning Tulfo justice and rule of law in the Philippines. Attorney Bagilat is a Tuwali human rights lawyer from Ifugao province. He is a senior lecturer in the University of the Philippines College of Law and a senior legal associate in the Institute of Human Rights of the UP Law Center. Previously, he served as a guest faculty member in Ifugao State University, where he also served as regent designate for the chairperson of the House of Representatives Committee on Higher and Technical Education. His research concentration is on human rights and vulnerable groups, particularly on indigenous peoples, persons with disabilities, women, and children. He received his Master of Laws degree from the University of Melbourne under the Australia Awards Scholarship and his Juris Doctor degree from the University of the Philippines, Diliman. Ladies and gentlemen, so all, please welcome Attorney Raymond Marvik Sibagilat to discuss Ipatulfo Mo, Discerning Tool for Justice and Rule of Law in the Philippines. Hi, good morning to everyone. But in Ilan, medyo mahaba yung time. <laughs> Kasi medyo mahaba-haba ang discussion actually natin dito. Okay. Um, uh, PowerPoint, please. Right. So, um, so, good morning again to everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to talk before you today. Uh, I'm going to discuss uh, what is rising, what is being known right now as reputational justice uh, pursuant to um, social media posts that include the most popular right now 
uh, would be through the uh, tool for shows uh, in social um, in social media, particularly in television shows and in YouTube and TikTok. So, uh, one piece. Oh, they are still sharing uh, opening it. Okay, so it's very uh, important to note that based from the title that I provided, uh, the noun or the name tool for the noun is now being used as a verb. So uh, when you say patulfo, if we have uh, foreigners who hear that, the explanation is that it, it, it means to report. Uh, but for uh, in this case, it's to report to a particular person. Okay, uh, for the laptop PowerPoint. <laughs> Maybe for the PowerPoint. Open. Apa. So, uh, just to start with a quanting cuenta, no? uh, it's, I, I hope for the younger generations, they would understand the history actually of uh, the shows uh, relating to the tulfos. Maybe for those who are uh, watching right now or listening in social media, most would uh, be more aware of Senator-elect uh, Rafi Tulfo. And they forgot that uh, this actually started with the older brother before. And this uh, the history started actually after the, uh, the um, People Power won in 1986, after the, uh, when the Marcoses left the Philippines and there was a gap or what they call a vacuum in relation to the implementation of laws in the Philippines. And then uh, Ramon Tool for the eldest, actually, of the two of us were the ones who started it. Baka hindi na nila kilala. <laughs> so it's very important later. Uh, I'll explain also why that's important, why the dynamics right now is also critical. No? Um, so before Tool for in action, there is uh, the show known as uh, Isumbong Mokay Tool for. And some might not even know that this was shown in the RPN9. Okay, it's a uh, RPN9 right now is being held by uh, CNN Philippines, the signal being held by uh, CNN Philippines. So, hindi na alam ng mga kabataan ngayon. And arguably, siguro, dahil din, kasi this started in 1991. So, baka yung iba hindi pa nga pinanganak. <laughs> All right, so now I'm gonna overlap. All right, so next slide, please. Okay, so in this presentation, I will provide the following. Uh, first, I will explain uh, the rights of tool for justice. Uh, sec um, then I will discuss the rule of law and due process as understood, uh, particularly by law students. And uh, following that would be the understanding of conflict between formal and formal legal system. And then the third type, which I will also discuss later, about alternative system of justice. Okay. And then fifth, I will provide a basic understanding of tool for justice. Why is this so popular right now? Uh, and then we will, I will provide ways forward or what can be done and then a conclusion. All right. Thank you. Next slide, please. Thank you. So what is tool for justice? Okay, the, the one before. Back, please. One slide. Okay. What is tool for justice? No? Uh, tool for justice actually is right now known as a method where uh, people who have concerns, regardless of who the parties are uh, involved, uh, who the parties involved are, uh, report their situation to Rafi Tulfo or any of the Tulfo brothers because the Tulfo brothers all have different shows. Okay. And then uh, whoever the Tulfo in that show is would be the one trying to uh, first discuss 
the concerns of the parties and then they would try to enter into some uh, try to enter into an amicable settlement first uh, and then if that if possible they would settle it during the show okay but uh, right now Rafi Tulfo uh, has uh, included in his show efforts to uh, he informs the parties that they could settle it uh, outside of the, uh, outside of the show or off air okay but before the way it goes is that a claim would be made on la uh, on air and then they would have to respond and then later on the public wouldn't really know whether or not it's settled or not okay now how did it develop so as i was saying earlier actually this started with the show of ramon tulfo in the early 90s so after uh, when democracy was restored uh before the most important aspect is who from the military uh who do you know from the military okay but after that the question was, um, who do you think could help you when you have cases against a particular party or against the government? And Tulfo tried, Ramon Tulfo tried to present himself as a champion of whoever would need support, okay, when it comes to particular claims. And in their uh, website, they actually say that the show is the forerunner of hard hitting aggressive public service and investigative shows okay uh, following this was his bro uh, were his brothers uh, ben rafi and erwin okay so erwin actually entered uh, ebs cbn and then uh, rafi through tv5 ben followed up in uh, rpn9 before and then they now continued with their own shows in uh, ptv4 Okay, but the most popular would be Rafi Pulfo in action. Okay, this has uh, succeeded in capturing the public's attention. And what is the measure for that? Currently, it has in uh, YouTube alone, it has 23.3 million subscribers. Okay, but those figures are useless. What does that really mean? It means that it is a top three YouTube channel in the Philippines. Okay, top three. Now, who are top one and top two? It's a whole network of ABS-CBN, number one, and the whole network of GMA, number two. And the personality is the one in number three. Okay, it's Rafi Tulfo. So as a personality, he has the biggest YouTube channel in the Philippines. Okay, and he has also um, moved beyond uh, the television show. Okay, so if you uh, were if you are up to date with the previous elections, he actually is a senator elect. Okay, but it's not just him. Okay, his son is now a representative in Kazan City, uh, in District Five, and the wife is also a representative for the party list group, uh, Act CIS, and uh, the brother is said to be going to be the new. Uh, Department of Social Welfare uh, Secretary. Okay. Now, why did it develop? There are several controversies against this before, but it developed with the help of uh, what people say would be some form of patronage as well, coming from the government. Okay. What does this mean? The tool force enjoyed the support of a very popular president. President Rodrigo Duterte. So people also look at uh, the Tulfos as an extension of uh, the president. So uh, this view of uh, the president's support of the Tulfos made it a pseudo government supported program as well. Okay. And there's some controversies. And most recently, the controversy would be in relation with the functions of the public attorney's office, okay? And there was a public spat between um, Resida Costa, the chief of the um, public attorney's office, regarding the process and methods being followed by the POW in relation to clients, okay? Uh, because uh, Senator-elect Rafi Tulfo made a statement uh, saying that the 
uh, processes of the POW are antedated. Okay, and uh, Chief Acosta mentioned that this was actually already uh, being addressed because they follow, uh, they are now uh, making use of a new uh, method of uh, uh, accepting clients, all right? Uh, and then I interviewed some POW lawyers and they informed me that what's actually frustrating is that they're actually being co-opted by uh, sometimes they feel like they're being co-opted by tool for shows. What does that mean? They said that there are times when they receive uh, recommendation letters uh, to accept a particular client. Although, of course, that's not binding, they feel that that's not necessary because they have their own processes. So those are the informal interviews that I've conducted with some POW lawyers. And that is the reason for the controversy. Okay, thank you. Next slide, please. In the scheme of things, where does this fall uh, under? So uh, we know that there's formal justice and formal justice would involve the civil and criminal justice that includes uh, those that are adopted by state-based judicial institutions and uh, implementers. Who are these uh, parties? No? It includes the police, prosecution, and the courts. Okay. It also includes those passed by our, uh, the legislative branch of government. So again, the most important aspect here is that it is formal state-based okay, justice institutions and procedures. Okay, Definitely under this, uh, tool for justice isn't a formal justice system because it's not state-based. Okay, But if it's not formal, is it informal? What does informal justice systems mean? Okay, so when you say informal justice systems, this include dispute resolution mechanisms falling outside the scope of the formal justice system. So some would say that tool for justice is actually an informal justice system. However, what they point out is that informal justice systems still are judicial system. What does that mean? It's still legal system. Those that are accepted under our laws, under the rules uh, in the country. And some point out that there's a tendency for tools for justice to be extrajudicial forms of justice systems. And when you ask why, their answer is because it goes against due process of law as provided under the Constitution. So what does that mean? So for example, they point out that there's a tendency when somebody would be called uh, because there's a complaint against them, is that TULFO already confronts them with the issue. And that person, because, of the, uh, because they are threatened, okay, feel like they would already have to answer or they would just have to act accept whatever would be asked of them, okay? And it would be more reputational in nature, okay? So because of fear of your reputation, people with the 23.3 million subscribers knowing your name and, uh, and uh, Tulfa saying that you are something like this and like that, then they would just say that that's not, uh, they wouldn't really have a chance to present their site properly and they wouldn't have any representation as well. Okay, second, because TULFO isn't really a judicial system or a uh, quasi-judicial uh, 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 agency, it is said that there's a tendency also of him uh, not being able to properly weigh the facts. Of course, facts matter. But when you're talking about something so publicized in the court of public opinion, the facts may tend to be uh, more dramatic or exaggerated and are not really supported by any evidence later on. All right. So some say that it doesn't fall under formal justice or informal justice. Rather, it could be deemed to be extrajudicial in nature. Okay. And that has limitations as well. But why is it so popular if that's the case? If it could be deemed to be extrajudicial, why is it so popular? Some would say that it is a reflection of the rule of law in the Philippines. Okay, in the recent survey of the uh, regarding 
uh, the ranking of the Philippines in uh, globally when it comes to rule of law, there's a deterioration in rule of law in the Philippines. And we are now ranked 102 out of 139 countries. Okay, so that is as of 2021. Okay, so this is a report coming from the World Justice Project, wherein it is deemed that rule of the rule of law index in the Philippines has dropped three places, and we're now at 102 out of 139 countries. Okay, and that is saddening because it also has an effect on the legal profession, on us lawyers. Okay, it it also affects uh, it challenges uh, the legal profession. Because with this alternative, people might not okay, approach lawyers anymore. Okay? They might consider this as the best option for them, even if they know that you couldn't really force others to act just based on a tool for supporting them uh, on air. Okay? So it's a big challenge. Next slide, please. So through, uh, through my class, we were able to uncover uh, the situation. Why is Tool for Justice so popular? And we first, we triangulated our uh, study by conducting an interview first. And then subsequently, we had a, a survey of all uh, of Tool for uh, viewers and listeners. Okay, and this were the results. Okay, so next slide, please. Uh, next slide. All right. So we interviewed uh, a person who identified to be a viewer and listener of Rafi Pool for in action. So we interviewed uh, Miss Jen, who's 27 years old, a civil servant, and earning 14,000 a month with salary grade three, okay? And she said that she watches 10 cases a night. Uh, so for Tool4 uh, presents different cases and uploads it online. And she spends basically around one to two hours daily um, to listening to uh, the cases brought to Tool4. And for her, she agrees that Rafi Tool4 brings people to justice and she feels that uh, one of the biggest uh, benefits of going to tool for is his ability to expedite the resolution of cases. Uh, although she notes that she still prefers to go to a lawyer if she has legal concerns, but recognizes limitations. Uh, she notes that people are being served by tool for, but uh, and that she's willing to go to the PAO if she has a concern, but she notes that uh, going to the PAO isn't really ideal all the time, okay, because of the uh, number of cases being handled by PAO. She feels that it might be better to go to a private lawyer still who will focus on her concerns. But again, if there is no private lawyer, then going to the PAO is a solution. But as an exception to the exception, she says that she would consider going to Tulfo if she believes that it will take a longer period for her uh, issue to be settled, okay? Particularly if she still needs to go to uh, different loops when uh, trying to address her situation, okay? Next slide, please. So with her answer, we created a multi phase purposive sampling uh, and uh, snowball sampling uh, survey, and this is two part. This had two parts. Okay, the first part determined the um, attitude towards tool for shows, and the second part determined awareness of the judicial system and perception of the effectiveness of judicial systems. So. Uh, the original survey had 114 who answered yes, and there were 126 who answered that they don't watch or listen or provided invalid answers. Okay, as a purposive sampling, what we did was we removed 
all the invalid and the no answers to focus on those who are watchers or listeners and listeners of uh, tool for shows. Okay, so out of uh, those who provided 114, uh, 26 came from Metro Manila and 87 came from outside Metro Manila. Okay, as part of the study, we also provided a reward system to the to those who answered. We uh, created the raffle system wherein 500 would be given to 10 people who answered the survey. So this would ensure that uh, this was with the hope that they would take the survey more seriously, particularly during the period when we uh, undertook this, which was in 2021, uh, early 2021. So it was still during the pandemic. We're, we're still in a pandemic, but yeah, uh, lockdowns were still prevalent during that time. Okay, thank you. Next slide. Okay, so these are just the preliminaries. So male, female. So more actually were female. Uh, and then the civil status showed that uh, most were single. Okay, and age group, uh, the young ones. Okay, 18 to 27. So uh, 86, 75% of them uh, out of the 114. Uh, from the age group of 18 to 27 and then but there's a good mix when it comes to employment so uh, there's some are in the private sector public sector self-employed okay but most were actually unemployed okay now just to take note before we proceed okay and for uh, context take note that the average time online in the Philippines currently is around 10 hours and 56 minutes, okay? And worldwide, we're actually higher than the worldwide average, which is 6 hours and 54 minutes, okay? Uh, in the source, we, it was also determined that 70.6% of Filipino internet users aged 16 to 64 actually you watch how to videos, tutorial videos, or educational videos each week over the internet. So this is a sort, this is also meant as an educational tool for this people. Next slide, please. Okay, and their educational attainment would be as follows. Mostly uh, or uh, college level. Uh, so they didn't graduate, but they reached uh, Legit level. So, okay. uh, frequency. So most answered that they uh, they only watch or listen sometimes or rarely. So thirty six to forty eight and forty eight respectively. But as uh, the watching and listening hours per day, we noted that, that most answered from zero to six hours. So if we go back to the um, interview earlier. She, uh, Jen noted that she took two hours a day, but the, we lumped this together as a zero to six, so 102 actually uh, answered watched per day. Okay, next slide, please. As to their economic status, so this is spread. Most actually earn uh, less than uh, 30,000 uh, per month. Okay, so most of the participants. But there was a good chunk as well who uh, refused to answer that question. Next slide, please. Okay, so based on the background that I provided earlier, so I had to ask a question. To whom do you listen to? Whom from the Tulfo brothers? And a great majority actually answered that they listened to Rafi. Okay, so more than Ben, Erwin, and Ramon. And surprisingly, even if uh, Ramon was a forerunner, okay, he, nobody from the participants actually listened to him anymore. M most or almost all actually listened to Rafi. Okay, so 80, more or less 86%. Okay, next. Okay, so how often... So sometimes it's the most common answer here. Okay, but 
again, as I mentioned earlier, since this is purposive sampling as well, so we only focus on everyone who answered rare, from rarely onwards. Okay, so uh, with the whether or not they're watching, right? So uh, this is a minority, the person who answered uh, no response. So there's one, but mostly some some would answer sometimes. Okay. Next. Okay, so you ask them, would the tool for shows be able to entertain complaints forwarded to them? And with this, you would see that definitely for them, okay, the tool for us are able to entertain the complaints that are forwarded to them. Okay, next slide. Okay, uh, this was just covered, but the tool for shows are also based on uh, a strongly agree and agree uh, are meant for public service. Okay, next slide, please. They also, most also, uh, there's a mix for this, but uh, more people agree that the Tool for shows are alternatives to judicial and administrative legal processes. Next slide, please. And that they provide justice to the concerns raised by their listeners and spectators. So if you approach the tool for in their show, they're able to uh, provide justice to the concerns that are being raised. So there's a feeling of assurance. Next slide, please. Okay, and they also believe that this is an expedient way to attain justice. This is consistent with the interview that we conducted. Okay, next slide. Okay, on a more personal level, we ask whether or not they allow the person to attain justice merely by just watching the show. And more people actually said that they feel that this is able to allow them to attain justice taken together. Okay, so more, more people actually said, more viewers and listeners who answered actually say that they agree. Okay. Next slide. And part of the service would be allowing them to access lawyers. Okay. Next slide. Okay. Aside from lawyers, it also assists them in the accessing uh, courts and quasi judicial offices. Okay, so that is as regards the first part of the test, of the survey, which looked at their, um, how they view the tool for shows, okay? But when asked regarding the legal system, we provided several questions. So one of this is, uh, the first one is this, whether or not they are aware of the legal processes required to institute a criminal action to prosecute uh, a person for an act or mission punishable by law, most say they do know, okay, the processes. Next. They also noted that they are aware of how to file uh, cases when it comes to civil actions. Okay, so similar to criminal actions. They agree that they, they are aware of ways on filing cases related to civil cases. Next slide. And as to administrative cases, uh, while a good number were undecided, most say that they agree with this statement. Next, access to a lawyer. Okay, so majority answered undecided. Okay, but taken together, uh, the agreement towards this statement is uh, there are more people who answered that they uh, agree and or strongly, dis uh, strongly agree 
okay, that they have access to lawyers, but a good number are undecided regarding this question. Next slide. Okay, as to whether or not they have access to courts and quasi-judicial offices, now this is a bit troubling. Again, most people uh, mentioned that they are undecided regarding uh, this question. They couldn't agree, but taken together, there's a it's close between uh, those who disagree and those who agree. Okay, so uh, more or less three percent. Okay. Uh, affirm this, uh, either agree or disagree with the statement. Okay. And that parties that go to courts are given the justice that they seek. A good number were, again, undecided. Okay. Next slide, please. And as to expediency, okay, most were undecided, but most strongly disagree or disagree okay, with the statement. Okay. And next, whether they believe that uh, judicial and quasi-judicial offices decide cases fairly, again, most were ambivalent or undecided. So, next slide. Whether or not they trust the justice system in the Philippines, okay? Uh, the good thing is that most agree, okay? But this is a bit troubling, noting that the undecided disagree and strongly disagree also provided a significant figure, okay? Next slide. And whether or not they trust the legal profession and lawyers in the Philippines, uh, they do agree that they trust the legal profession and lawyers, okay? But there's also a good number who are undecided, okay, as to whether or not they would trust the legal profession and lawyers. Okay, thank you. So those were descriptive statistics. It only shows how it's also, it's just a tally of how people uh, feel or uh, about the legal profession and TULFO shows and uh, uh, the way that they provide justice. No? But we also, we went further than that. We also created an uh, analysis to determine the intersectionality between the different uh, attitudes relating to uh, TULFO justice and the legal system in the Philippines. And this is more important because uh, as an inferential study, this provide, and we made use of correlation here, we could see the relationship between the different uh, factors involved. Okay, and this shows that, next slide please. Okay, so what I used was a Spearman's rank order correlation and I'd like to thank uh, my, uh, RA, who also assisted me, uh, Roy uh, Pablo, who uh, helped me with this. We we're actually going through this again last night up until early this morning. Okay. And we made use of Spearman's rank order. Okay. So uh, this is a correlation coefficient used for non parametric measures of the strength and direction of association that exists between two variable measures on at least an ordinal scale. So take note, since this is a Likert scale, uh, we made use of an, or this is an ordinal uh, variable that was, be, that was used. No? So, okay, thank you. Next slide. Okay. So there's a negative correlation, okay, between the more that they are aware of the legal processes, the less they believe that the tool for shows are alternative to legal processes. Okay, so if you are aware of the legal processes, it's more likely that you don't think that tool for shows are alternatives to legal processes. Okay, next slide. Okay, there's also a negative relationship uh, between the access to lawyers. Uh, for so for the, the more that they have access to lawyers, the less they believe that tool for shows are alternatives to judicial and administrative 
legal processes. Okay, next slide. Okay, there's also a negative correlation between uh, the more they have access to lawyers, the less they believe that tool for shows assist the public in, ac in accessing courts and quasi-judicial offices. Next slide. There's a positive correlation on the other end. Uh, the less they have access to lawyers, the more they believe that tool for shows are meant for public service. Okay, next slide. There's also a positive correlation. Uh, the less they have access to lawyers, the less they believe that tools for shows are alternatives to judicial and administrative legal processes. Okay. There's a positive correlation. So the less they have access to lawyers, the more they believe that tools for shows assist the public in accessing courts and quasi-judicial offices. Next slide. A uh, negative correlation as to the more they believe that parties that go to courts are given justice, the less they believe that tools for shows are not meant for public services. Next slide. Positive correlation as to the more they believe that judicial and quasi-judicial offices decide cases expediently, the more they believe that tools for shows are able to entertain the complaints forwarded to them. Okay, next slide. And again, positive correlation, the more they believe that judicial and quasi-judicial offices decide cases expediently, the more they believe that tool for shows are meant for public service. Next slide. The negative correlation uh, as to the more they believe that judicial and quasi-judicial offices decide cases expediently, the less they believe that tool for shows are not meant for public services. Okay. Positive correlation as to the more they believe that judicial and quasi-judicial offices decide case expediently, the more they believe that shows are alternative to judicial and administrative legal processes. Okay, next slide. The same with the more they believe that judicial and quasi-judicial Offices decide case expediently, the more they believe that tool for shows provide justice. Next slide. Positive correlation as to the more they believe that judicial and quasi-judicial offices decide cases in, uh, expediently, the more they believe that tool for shows allow them to attain justice. Okay, next. Okay, so the more they believe that judicial and quasi-judicial offices decide case fairly, the more they believe that tool for shows are for public service. Okay, next slide. So negative correlation, the more they believe that judicial and quasi-judicial offices decide cases fairly, the less they believe that tool for shows are not meant for public service. Okay. Next slide. Positive correlation as to the more they believe that judicial and quasi-judicial offices decide case fairly, the more they believe that tool for shows allow them to attain justice. Negative correlation as to the more they believe in the justice system in the Philippines, the less they believe that tool for shows are not meant for public service. Okay. Next slide. Okay. Positive correlation as to the more they believe in the justice system in the Philippines, the more they believe that tool for shows allow them to attain justice. Okay, and last two. Uh, positively correlated, the more they believe in the legal profession uh, and, and lawyers, the more they believe that tool for shows are meant for public service. Second, and negative correlation, the more they believe in the legal profession and lawyers, the less they believe that tool for shows are meant for public service. Okay. So based on that, what's the analysis? 
Okay, so before we proceed, pala, the limitations okay, of purposive sampling. Take note that since this is purposive sampling, uh, we had to rely on people answering the surveys truthfully. No? And that's the reason why we adopted rewards as part of the uh, sampling method. Okay, uh, but and uh, 114 actually is a good figure, although we could expand this further and we have to make sure uh, because based on the uh, results, most people come outside of Metro Manila, but we don't know whether or not it's actually representative of the actual figures of the uh, listeners and watchers. Uh, there might be over-representation of people outside Metro Manila answering the, uh, the survey. Okay, and also we'd like to take note that since this is uh, mostly in a preliminary stage, we will still have to do uh, to finalize the statistics no? just to make sure that there are no uh, issues regarding to the uh, results that we, we are hoping to uh, pub publish this later on. Okay, now based on the analysis, we get to get a better picture of who really are the viewers and listeners of uh, Tool for Shows, okay? It's important to take note that while we couldn't say that, we couldn't generalize this, okay? But we could at least debunk some of the, um, some of the myths regarding the show, okay? While there's a good number of people who earn, uh, who earn less than, uh, 10,000, actually 23 or 20% of those who answered uh, the question are viewers and, or listeners who earn less than 10,000 per month. We, could, we should also take note that there are also people who earn more than 40,000 to, uh, to, to more than 200,000 who listens to uh, tool for shows. Okay, so it's not true that only those who are uh, down the line in the economic status would be the ones who are watching or listening. Okay, but we could also conclude that based on the answers provided, okay, for this 114 participants who answered that they watch or view, that most of them actually fall below the threshold of the 30,000 to 40,000 limit, okay? And those who are gainfully employed under this would already consider themselves to be uh, middle to lower middle class, okay? Also, we could take note that based on the answers, it seems as if that most were uh, part of the youth sector, Okay, with 18 to 27 of them, okay, 75% okay, answering the uh, survey uh, and, ad and stating that they indeed watch or listen to uh, tool for shows. Okay. And most actually are uh, attained college level or even uh, went beyond that. Uh, 14 actually or 12 percent have postgraduate degrees. Okay. So it means that it's not really about the economic status, it's not really about the educational level. Rather, there's already an ongoing shift regarding the Philippine, the understanding of the Philippine legal system, okay? And the shift in the Philippine legal system should be viewed in the lens also of the changing dynamics of the rise of social media, people learning online, people knowing more about legal systems, learning more about um, cases online and following uh, developments based on what they view online. And a good example here would be the recent case of uh, the San Vicente case regarding the driver in uh, 
Mandaluyo, uh, from Mandaluyo. And people were noting the difference between how he is given media mileage by being allowed to speak before the media by the police, no less. Okay, well, on the other end of the spectrum, there are those who are immediately sent to jail and sometimes even forbidden to talk to their lawyers, okay, which is a violation of their rights. So this comparison is now being amplified with the use of social media. And through Tulfo, okay, we are trying to sense that people are now treating them as their champions in relation to the right to represent as for the right to representation. Tulfos, the Tulfos are now becoming the advocates. Okay. Well, in the formal legal system, we have lawyers, okay, in the informal uh, legal system or at least an alternative legal system, the Tulfos are now becoming the champions, the advocates of the parties who are who want to raise their concerns. Um, on air. Okay. Next slide, please. Okay. Yes, yes. Is there a problem with this? Okay. There's a good problem. Well, we couldn't say this is a good problem, but for those who watch or listen and who believe that they're able to attain justice because of Tulfo. The idea is that for them this is good, okay, uh, because they are they feel that sense of fulfillment, okay. But the problem is how do you link this alternative justice system to the concept of justice? What for them is justice? Is it reputational justice only? That if you hurt me, I'll do this because for me you deserve it. Or is it really for them to achieve something that they feel that they should have uh, received in the first place? For example, if they are kicked out unlawfully from their, uh, from their work, okay, would they be allowed to go back? For them, justice would be allowing them to go back and work. Okay, but would that be possible? Or would they just want to hurt the reputation of their company for them? Is that the justice? Or would an apology suffice on air? Okay. So in the mind of the Filipino, this is now changing, but with the dynamics of social media. And to move forward, we have to recognize this. We couldn't run away from it. The elections and everything else. Part of the dynamics relating to how it happened is undeniably with, a, with the help of social media. Okay? And this is the same with the legal system. Okay? Second, the concept of justice should be clarified. What should be the concept of justice? Should it be within the parameters of our constitution? Definitely, yes. But for them, is that the same thing? People would want to say that justice cannot be bought. But definitely, you can hire a good lawyer. Definitely, good lawyers okay, are able to bring, the, to bring them justice. Okay, and if they wouldn't want to spend, oh, definitely, it would be harder for them to attain justice. Would it be easier if they were rich to go to the courts? Definitely, if you talk about the state of our uh, transportation sector. With the rising uh, cost of uh, gas, if you have money, you wouldn't have to worry about that. If you are a regular person, a commuter, would you rather try to look or go to the POW and then uh, discuss your case with them with no assurance, as opposed to just calling Tulfo online and relaying your case. More than that, would you have to secure evidence 
would a gut wrenching story work? Maybe we don't know. Hopefully, there's a way of uh, filtering all the callers, right, to raise their case. But we have to recognize all of these things, and part of that would be the need to educate people. Now, as I mentioned earlier, if seventy point six percent of sixteen uh, of uh, Filipino social media users, internet users, okay make use of social media applications to learn, then maybe we have to shift okay, and pivot with the use of the internet. Okay? Fourth, we also need to recognize that based on the answers, yes, indeed, they trust the legal system, they trust the judicial system, they trust lawyers. But if you notice, most were actually undecided or ambivalent about the legal system. What we hope for was for them to be secure with lawyers, for them to trust lawyers. But most said undecided. Worse, some said they disagree or strongly disagree. Okay. And with that, we have to change the image of the legal profession. And unfortunately, maybe the code of professional responsibility, regardless of what we place there under uh, regarding the lawyer and uh, indigent clients, and the laws that we have, maybe this isn't working already. Therefore, we also need to expand our legal aid. With the implementation of the uh, student practice rule, okay, maybe this would work. But again, we have to look at this closely because while that is being implemented, people might, from ambivalent, they might go through strongly disagree or disagree. Okay. And we need to support pro bono lawyer. Okay. Unfortunately, what we have right now are more lawyers being red tagged okay, just because of the clients that they take. Also, 61 lawyers, uh, if I remember correctly, have been attacked or died during the term of President Duterte, unfortunately. With that, would they be willing to take on cases, particularly pro bono cases? Okay. It's hard to, to tell right now. You have to secure yourself before you secure others. And if you're talking about your life, some, some would really say, or most probably, would say that it's not worth it and they would desist, okay? So those are the things that you have, we have to consider as a profession, okay? That we have to move forward, but we need to do more right now, okay? Now, is this a chastisement of tool for justice? No, definitely. Maybe it's time for us to also weigh about its value as an alternative justice system, and then rein it in by trying to explain if it would be adopted later on and expand it further with uh, Senator Rafi Tulfo. Maybe we could ask that it adopt a model that would make sure that it is compliant with due process and rule of law. And it would avoid sensationalism because what we want to avoid is mob rule. Okay and just attacking the reputation of people. So part of expanding legal aid would also include that. Recognizing that, yes, it has benefits, definitely. Okay. But for those who are uh, in a traditional formal justice system, they might have qualms against it. But definitely, since this is already the trend, 23.3 million subscribers is no joke. Okay. And it's important for us to be critical about it, but we also need to make sure that we are changing along with the times. The internet is very powerful. Social media is very powerful. So with that, 
I'd like to thank everyone. And I'd also like to thank uh, my students who helped me with this. So particularly uh, Chelsea Antonio, Del Ferrer, Dayan Losa, Isaiah Tagarao, Judy Ann Sheng, Mika Aison, Richmond Alianan, Sokte Guzman. And again, Roy Pablo and Mar Ibagin for their help with the statistics for this report. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Attorney Bagilat. There's a, well, we may have overextended, but uh, there's just one question uh, here in the chat box. I think this may be addressed to Professor Hardelesa. <clears throat> and I would read, regarding new issues and questions on the influence of technological development, do you think that the rule against advertising for lawyers soliciting legal business in the CPR has to be enforced stricter or should be loosened with the dawn of the technological age? Thank you. Professor Hardelesa, may we? Uh, do I need to answer that now, uh, Attorney uh, the, This is the, uh, Professor Hardelesa, this is the portion supposedly for the plenary okay. for the first two lectures. Oh, so okay. that uh, uh, the people will not be able to uh, forget what the first lectures were. Okay, so yes, uh, we should be more liberal now as far as advertising is concerned. Um, if you, if the, the person who asked the question will still remember the particular provisions in the code, uh, it does not say that we are very strict as far as advertising or marketing our legal services. Uh, I always ask the question, are lawyers allowed to, can they um, lie, cheat, steal, or advertise? Lawyers are allowed to advertise to a certain limit. Of course, uh, advertisement should be limited. Um, there are the different rules provided for un, uh, in, under the canons two and three, in which we, we have to follow. Uh, yes, lawyers are allowed to advertise. How will the public know? Like what uh, Professor Bag uh, uh, Bagilat said, uh, pro bono lawyering is always available. How will the public know that there is such a pro bono lawyering offered by IDP, by PAU, or, or, or other lawyers who are ready to render their service? Uh, yes, it will. It needs to be liberalized. Uh, in the United States, if let me just compare again, um, there are local ABA chapters who allows their, their lawyers to advertise. Maybe for those who have been to the United States, you will be surprised to see that along the highway, there are large pictures of lawyers who would say uh, immigration lawyer, need uh, a tort lawyer, it's all there, but is it, isn't that advertising? Yes, of course it's advertising. And they have already gone to that uh, part where you can also show your face and on TV, on, on magazines, and on all other forms of communication. Well, what do they do? Um, uh, some time ago, uh, some local ABA chapter, they allow their lawyers to submit, uh, they say, for example, a, a, a piece of their advertisement they bring it to the ABA chapter to which they belong, and then it will be like our sensor. They find out whether it's decent, whether it's uh, actually not uh, false or or, or or those those things. And once they it is approved, it is approved that they can use it. Uh, I think in some chapters it is approved and they can use use it for the next three years. Uh, if they want it changed, they will return again to their chapter and have it, uh, let's say, censored or, or feel that maybe it doesn't have any taste. Uh, so really, um, advertising should be uh, liberalized here, especially in our country, because we are not into the different kinds of a practice of law. It's not only limited inside the courtroom, as I said before, earlier. But uh, there are other forms of lawyering and pro bono services uh, which can be extended to those who need those services. Yes, uh, it should be liberalized. Thank you for asking that. Thank you, Professor Hardelesa. Okay, uh, we will now proceed with our next lecture uh, on the rules of the Commission on Bar Discipline by Professor Ramon S. Esguera graduate of the UP College of Law. He is a professorial lecturer in eight College of Laws, including the University of the Philippines. He was a 2013 bar examiner in political and international. Justice in charge of the National Prosecution Service, the NBI, the Bureau of Immigration and Witness Protection, the Security and Benefit Program, the Department of Justice. 
and he is sent in the advisory council chairman of the board of directors and past president of the intellectual property association of the philippines he was the nash he was the national director of the commission in integrity and bar discipline ladies and gentlemen former governor uh, professor ramon esquera thank you <clears throat> thank you uh attorney Arevalo. thank you to uh, everyone the uh, first two speakers for sheet uh, of course uh, attorney Prof. Bagilat and uh, Prof. Emerson uh, thank you for inviting me over uh, <clears throat> I have a uh, PowerPoint uh, presentation from on the base of which I will uh, take my uh, brief uh, sharing with you and uh, <clears throat> And this will uh, mostly be based on uh, the experience I had as former uh, director of the Commission on Bar Discipline. And of course, as a practicing lawyer uh, for almost uh, more than 42 years, all right? <clears throat> and uh, you may be wondering why I am teaching in so many law schools. Uh, I find teaching law more pristine and more pure than practicing law itself. And you, you will, uh, you will have to understand that from the context of uh, uh, the realities of uh, the practice of law. All right, the uh, saying, you know, uh, not necessarily in jest. It's not what you know, but whom you know that matters in the. Uh, administration of justice. But be that as it may, let me take off from the lawyer's oath. Can you uh, flash the first slide, please? All right. Now, I, I am starting with the oath because to me, the code of professional responsibility, all the canons, uh, all the rules there about lawyer conduct or misconduct uh, are embodied here. So uh, uh, to me, uh, when you say, uh, when you took the oath and uh, said that you will do no falsehood nor consent to the doing of any in court, nor wittingly or willingly promote or sue any groundless, false or unlawful suit, or give aid nor consent to the same, nor delay, uh, uh, you will not delay man for money uh, and will conduct yourself as a lawyer according to the best of your knowledge and discretion with all fidelity as well as to the courts as to your clients and impose this uh, voluntary obligation uh, without any mental reservation. So uh, uh, the, the, the question that uh, even now I want to ask is uh, when was the last time, except for those teaching, of course, uh, uh, legal ethics, in the college, uh, where was the last time that uh, uh, you have read this? <laughs> All right, and uh, have you ever wondered whether or not uh, you have been guided by the oath that you have taken? All right, now, so uh, the oath to me uh, synthesizes the virtues and values, the duties and obligations of any lawyer. And uh, uh, therefore, it is a solemn promise uh, uh, to yourself, first of all, uh, but uh, most of all, uh, to the country, to your clients, and uh, of course, to, the, to your colleagues, to our colleagues in the legal profession, and as well as the society at large. So uh, it is important, therefore, to me, uh, that in everyday life, as we practice law, as we uh, practice our profession, we are guided by this. Uh, though we don't have to read it uh, uh, every day, uh, uh, but there is nothing wrong for us uh, to be guided by it every day. The next slide, please. Now, I, 
permit me to provoke. Uh, those, I said, uh, four, this, this, these are four words uh, in very bold, uh, uh, you know, font. So help me God, in quotes. The question is, if we find this at all significant, uh, the oath that we took until this very day in our professional life, whether you're simply teaching law, whether you're simply, uh, you know, uh, doing uh, uh, NGO work uh, as a lawyer uh, and uh, actually practicing law. All right. So uh, the, you may uh, refer to this as an solicited advice for me. Uh, the uh, should be correctly advised with the C, but uh, be that as it may, revisit, as I said, the all from time to time and renew your, my commitment before the very God whose help we invoke. This invocation of God to help us when we uh, took the off, when we say the off, uh, is a very clear recognition of uh, how imperfect we each, each one of us can be. Imperfect in the sense that we need God so that we will be able to fulfill those duties and obligations that we were sworn to. Why? Because of our imperfections. The frailties and imperfections that actually characterize any human, any human being. Whether he, he is the chief justice of the Supreme Court, whether he is the ombudsman, uh, whether he is the secretary of justice, uh, whether he is the uh, most knowledgeable of all, uh, uh, of all legal minds uh, that we have here in the country, or even elsewhere, all right? So uh, I hope we can reflect on this uh, and uh, uh, be provoked in a way uh, to reflect on this. Can we go to the next slide? All right. Uh, you have the rules. No? Uh, it has been there quite some time. And uh, uh, we know that the rules govern the uh, investigation of administrative complaints against uh, lawyers by the Integrated Bar of the Philippines, or Rule 139B. And Section 12 of the said rule is pertinent as it prescribes the procedure before the IPP, which I will not attempt actually to uh, uh, read here or even dwell on it uh, uh, one by one. No, that will not be uh, that will not be possible given the time uh, constraints. Now let's navigate the process. This is how I will be able to explain the procedure. You know, there is a flow chart that follows. Uh, that will be most helpful uh, and uh, as I put here, not at all time consuming. And we will understand how the process uh, is initiated in the investigation of complaints against lawyers. Next slide, please. All right, I don't know if you can read this. Uh, I will try to <laughs> grapple with uh, my poor vision. Uh, reading through this. I refer to this as the subway of uh, uh, the Commission on Bar Discipline uh, Procedure. Uh, by the way, if I recall correctly, the uh, Board of Governors has renamed this Commission on Integrity and Bar Discipline, okay? not simply Commission on Bar uh, Discipline. So how is the case uh, initiated? There are actually three points uh, from where uh, uh, a verified complaint, which is required, a verified complaint uh, may be filed. First, uh, of course, it's the Supreme Court. You can file it with the Supreme Court. 
Second, you can file it directly with the Integrated Bar of the Philippines, the Commission on Bar Discipline. And then third, we will be at the chapter level of the IBP. Uh, there are so many chapters all over the country, uh, and uh, we have nine regions, uh, each region having so many chapters. And uh, the complaint there at that level is filed with chapter secretary. Uh, and it is the responsibility of the chapter president to actually endorse the complaint to the uh, Integrated Bar of the Philippines National Office, particularly the Commission on Bar Discipline. Now, uh, let's look at what happens. If the complaint is filed with the Supreme Court, uh, uh, and by the way, you take note of the word there or the phrase moto proprio, for the investigator lawyer, moto proprio, even without a complaint, even on the basis of anonymous complaint. Uh, and the Supreme Court, uh, from what I know, actually uh, designates uh, the National Bureau of Investigation to investigate you know, discreetly uh, uh, those uh, lawyers reported to be misbehaving in the exercise of their uh, profession. Now, assuming that there is a verified complaint, uh, uh, the, uh, an, there is an initial evaluation. And uh, I exactly do not know, but we are confident it is simply the clerk of the uh, Supreme Court and bank. Okay, because all disciplinary cases taken by the Supreme Court and bank. Now, uh, what happens there? Well, if on the face of the complaint, there is really nothing, uh, meaning no basis to proceed uh, with the investigation, and it can be dismissed. Okay, uh, and the Supreme Court can order the dismissal. But if uh, there is uh, actually a basis to proceed, uh, then uh, it may be referred to the office of the bar confidant. And the bar confidant uh, actually recommends to the Supreme Court uh, the next steps to be taken by the court. Uh, one uh, primarily will be requiring the uh, respondent to file his comment or answer, verified as well, to the uh, complaint. And then uh, the court normally requires a reply coming from the complainant, all right? Then uh, you may say, will there be a memorandum? You may ask, will there be a memorandum or will there be a hearing there? No. Uh, from my experience, my so many years with the degraded part of the Philippines, both as a sitting governor and as a, as the uh, uh, director for, uh, for the bar discipline, uh, uh, commission on bar discipline, and even as an investigating commissioner or investigating uh, uh, a member of the uh, commission on bar discipline, the uh, Supreme Court after the submissions of the parties to it, refer the matter uh, for further proceedings to the integrated bar of the Philippines. Then it goes, of course, to the Commission on Bar Discipline and how the president you know, on behalf of the Board of Governors uh, 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 will endorse it to the uh, commissioner, meaning the director of the bar discipline, and then uh, it will be assigned to a to an investigating commissioner. Now, uh, uh, you see, the there is a word here, uh, I mean, recommend. No, we will not go there, there first because uh, uh, it has to go through, you know, a, a step by step, uh, as you will note from this chart, uh, the referral of the case, uh, whether it is, uh, I'm sorry, no, I missed uh, discussing the initiation of the complaint at the uh, level of the IPP itself, or even the referral from a chapter of the complaint. So it all uh, goes to the Commission on Bar Discipline. And then uh, uh, 
uh, even that the, the, the cases referred by the uh, Supreme Court, uh, they are referred to an investigating commissioner. And uh, first, with the uh, director of the Commission on Bar Discipline, and then the investigating commissioner issues a notice to answer, all right? Uh, the uh, normal period is 15 days, but uh, extendable. And then uh, uh, a mandatory conference follows. No more reply coming from the, you know, at that point in time. And then uh, the, in the mandatory conference, again, like a pre-trial that we know, there can be stipulation of facts. Uh, there can be a definition or the limitation of issues uh, as well. All right. And then uh, after the preliminary mandatory conference, I mean, mandatory conference, there will be a submission of the parties' respective position papers. All right. Then a period is given, again, extendable, uh, but uh, uh, look at the uh, uh, possibility uh, that a clarificatory hearing uh, may be. Uh, ordered or directed by the investigating commissioner, okay? And uh, after uh, uh, the written submissions, after the clarificatory hearing, assuming there will be one, uh, you go to, uh, I mean, the submission of the case for decision. It's not decision per se. It's more report and recommendation, all right? So uh, there is this report uh, and recommendation uh, by the investigating uh, commissioner, uh, to whom? To the Board of Governors. And uh, uh, it is the Board of Governors actually uh, uh, that will evaluate, uh, assess uh, whether or not uh, there is basis to affirm, to reverse, modify uh, the report and recommendation. Uh, there is no motion for reconsideration, by the way that may be filed before the investigating commission, okay? Then, uh, if the Board of Governors uh, makes a, issues a resolution, uh, that may be the subject of a motion for reconsideration, only once, okay, only once. The report, however, uh, of whatever resolution, resolution, no? Uh, uh, of the Board of Governors is also recommendatory, all right? Uh, uh, take note that the one who has the final say, you know, in this process is still the Supreme Court, okay? So uh, the report and recommendation of the investigating commissioner is recommendatory to the board. The recommendation or the resolution of the Board of Governors is recommendatory to the Supreme Court, even if it is a recommendation for dismissal, okay? And uh, uh, the uh, ultimate, therefore, uh, resolution of the case lies uh, in the hands of uh, the Supreme Court, sitting in bank. There can be, one, as I said, one motion for consideration with a Board of Governors uh, resolution. And then, uh, uh, as I already indicated, the resolution of the Board of Governors goes to the Supreme Court. Now, the Supreme Court, you know, okay, again, in the exercise of its, what we may say, plenary power over uh, disciplinary cases involving lawyers, may affirm, may reverse, may modify, or even order a further uh, investigation of the case. All right, we go to the next slide. Oh, you know, before going into the problems of the procedure under Rule 139B and uh, based on that flow chart that I have presented, it is not amiss here to state that uh, there is a necessity for us uh, to look into why is it that there is a need for imposing sanctions to the erring members of the bar? And uh, you know, uh, the, the, here is a rundown uh, very quickly. The purpose of a lawyer discipline proceedings 
is to protect the public and the administration of justice from lawyers who have uh, not discharged, no, will not discharge or unlikely to discharge properly their professional duties to clients, the public, the legal system, and the legal profession. Also, upon the filing and service of formal charges, lawyer discipline proceedings should be public and disposition of lawyer discipline should be public in cases of disbarment, suspension, and reprimand. Only in cases of minor misconduct when there is little or no injury to a client, the public, the legal system, or the profession, and when there is little likelihood of repetition by the lawyer, should private discipline be imposed. The meaning of public here is not really uh, exposing uh, the proceedings before the commission and bar discipline uh, because as a rule, and it is a very strict rule, the disciplinary proceedings, the hearings and, and all that, the uh, submission submitted, I mean, given uh, uh, are actually strictly confidential. And that's why you hear cases, you know, of uh, lawyers who uh, whose case against them before the integrated bar of the Philippines have been publicized, uh, but only as to the fact that there was a case filed, but not as to the details or the specification of the allegations against the lawyer. They are strictly confidential. Next slide, please. The third. These standards are designed to, uh, for use in imposing a sanction or sanctions, following a determination by clear and convincing evidence that a member of the legal profession has violated a provision of the code or responsibility of the author, uh, the lawyer's oath. Descriptions in these standards of substantive disciplinary offenses are not intended to create grounds for determining culpability independent of the code of professional responsibility. The standards constitute a model setting forth a for determining sanctions, permitting flexibility and creativity uh, uh, in assigning sanctions uh, in particular cases of lawyer misconduct. They are designed to promote consideration uh, uh, of all factors relevant to imposing appropriate level of sanctions in an individual case, consideration of the appropriate weight of such factors in light of the stated goals of the lawyer discipline and consistency in the imposition of disciplinary sanctions for the same or similar offenses within and among uh, jurisdictions. Okay, next slide please. Disciplinary sanction is imposed uh, so far as the scope of what sanctions may uh, uh, embody uh, on a lawyer upon a finding or acknowledgement that the lawyer has engaged in professional misconduct. Okay, next slide, please. Well, when I say here justice late, admittedly, just like all cases, whether criminal, uh, civil, or administrative, uh, they uh, administrative proceedings against lawyers, disciplinary proceedings against lawyers. You may see, you know, in that simple chart that the process is not that cumbersome. Okay, uh, that is uh, very deceiving, and I will tell you why in a bit. More significant uh, uh, that uh, must be noted here is that it is the Supreme Court, as I already mentioned earlier, that has the last say on the case against a lawyer. Okay, so. Uh, and then, yet, therefore, you have to study closely and know how a complaint may be initiated, as I already explained, uh, 
And uh, uh, as experience has shown, please speaking from my own experience, all cases end up with the IBP uh, for investigation and recommendation. Okay, so the investigating commissioner's report, as I already mentioned, is purely recommendatory to the Board of Governors of the IBP, no motion for reconsideration there. Now, let's go to the next slide. The Board of Governors deliberates ideally once a month. Oh, I, I put there in close parentheses, ideally once a month, when it meets to tackle business, meaning its main business as, as an association, uh, as the National Lawyers Association of Lawyers. But this rarely happens, all right? They only meet once a month. Uh, the board only meets once a, uh, once a month. And part uh, the second part of the agenda, actually lawyer cases, uh, cases involving lawyers. Uh, but you know, the first part of the agenda, the main business uh, uh, that have to be taken up by the board. Uh, and they take up the whole day already. At that point in time, there will be no no more time for the board to take up the bar discipline cases. So uh, imagine, you know, uh, if for one month, say 50, uh, 50 resolutions have been submitted for consideration to the board, there is a deferment in the cases. Then the next month, you no, know, uh, the 50 cases will again be added supposedly to the recommendations. Then uh uh you know the process goes on and on until the inventory becomes unmanageable okay so uh i did mention that the decision of the board of governors this is also recommendatory and only one motion for consideration may be filed by either party now the supreme court i did say can affirm reverse modify or order further investigation all right now uh, before actually concluding uh, well i think uh, yes i have to discuss this inherent witnesses you know uh ibp elections uh come every so often every two years and uh, every two, two years there is therefore a change in leadership and uh, when you say there is a change of leadership, there is a change, of course, in the officers uh, to be uh, appointed by the president with the concurrence of the board of governors. Uh, and that holds true for the investigating commissioners. So uh, for all intents and purposes, an investigating commissioner has only a tenure of two years, all right? And uh, if uh, he has given, been assigned rather a number of cases, say 50 cases for two years. Question is, will he be able to dispose of them in the two year uh, period that uh, he will be there as investigating commissioner? Mm -hmm. Or will he uh, leave you know, uh, some of these cases uh, to those who will be eventually appointed to replace him or her as investigating commissioner? See, so, uh, and not only that, even the commissioner, meaning the director of the participate changes depending on uh, 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 what the leadership says, especially, of course, the president of the uh, IBP, the national uh, IBP. Then, uh, as I did, I did say already earlier, you know, the backlog becomes unmanageable. Imagine meeting once a month supposedly but unable to meet uh, it will be good uh, again from my experience if the board will be able to take up say uh, 100 uh, to a maximum of 200 cases a year okay uh, but that uh, is uh, too uh, uh, too presumptuous on my part uh, it is possible because, you know, the board, the national officers, the board of governors, they attend uh, uh, so many functions all over the Philippines, regional conventions, uh, uh, conferences, seminars, 
et cetera. And uh, uh, they don't have a quorum, more often than not. Okay, they are unable to master a quorum. If they are unable to master a quorum, how can they make a decision? Not only that, at least during our time, and I speak no, during, our, during our time, uh, we uh, were assigned, say, the investigating commissioner submits uh, his report and recommend, his or her report and recommendation, uh, and a board, uh, I mean, member of the board, a reporting governor is assigned uh, certain cases, who, and he will be the one to report it out during the board of governors. That's how we uh, deemed it wise to accelerate the process. Otherwise, if we will only be reading uh, the recommendation and the records every time we meet, no, it will take forever. It will take forever. Now, uh, so uh, again, based on what we did before, uh, we decided that the uh, consideration of all these reports and recommendations coming from the investigating commissioner should be taken up in a separate meeting of the Board of Governors, if possible, in two days, two successive days. So what happened during the time of President Vicente Hoyas, we will be billeted in a hotel uh, outside the uh, uh, outside the national office, meaning a little far off the national office, so that we will not be bothered. And we will be bringing all the records uh, and we will consider the cases in the two-day meeting. And uh, there was zero backlog. By the time that uh, that term uh, finished, uh, there was zero backlog. And uh, mind you, uh, we discovered that there were actually cases that have not been moving, okay. being hidden from us, being hidden from the board. All right. Uh, and uh, uh, it's only when the Supreme Court makes a, a resolution ordering us to report what has happened to the case or cases they have referred to us so many years ago uh, that we will look for them and they will resurface. Oh, there is something uh, anomalous there. Uh, we were able to uncover that and address that as well. There are situations when the investigating commissioners, you know, take the position, they want to be appointed, they don't want to do the job. They have not even set one hearing, uh, the case at least for one hearing. Okay, and then, you know, they, their term ends uh, without resolving any case. Now, the delay in the final resolution level of the Supreme Court. So the uh, decision, whatever the decision is, okay, you know, will actually be, uh, will actually be delayed. Okay, so inherent therefore uh, in the process uh, of uh, investigation of lawyer misconduct uh, is the delay by reason of uh, what, no, for the reasons that I have already stated. Okay. Let's take the next slide. This is the concluding. Uh, my, uh, my, my, my simple uh, take uh, about uh, all this is this, okay. Uh, we all suffer, all stakeholders suffer because an errant lawyer, you know, can still practice while his case is pending because it takes, as I said, what, two years, five years, or even more, uh, uh, not counting even the pendency, the time eaten up by the pendency of the motion for reconsideration. How about, about one who aspires, a lawyer who aspires to join the judiciary, uh, who is who has no option but to wait for the final word of the Supreme Court on the case against him or her. He will not be given a clearance by the IBP, which is required 
when he applies uh, and is required by the Judicial Embark Council. Well, because that is a requirement that the applicant has no pending administrative case against him or her. Uh, and you ask me, is there justice there? There is none. There is none. Uh, you see, uh, uh, you have to remember that one rule that governs the proceedings in the uh, integrated part of the Philippines, all disciplinary law proceedings against lawyers, uh, is that even if the complainant withdraws the complaint, even if the complainant executes an affidavit of desistance, even if the complainant uh, says uh, that uh, he or she was mistaken in filing the case because of misapprehension of facts, uh, or uh, he or she was misinformed uh, of the alleged uh, misconduct of the respondent, it will still be the Supreme Court who will say whether or not the proceedings and eventually a sanction may be imposed on him. So we don't talk of affidavit of decisions. We don't talk of uh, withdrawal of the complaint here. That cannot be the simple basis of uh, a dismissal of the complaint against a lawyer. All right. So uh, I don't know if I captured uh, what has been uh, assigned to me this morning. But let me end uh, again with uh, how I started. You know, we have a system uh, of justice uh, that I hope we have an idea about. Whether it's criminal, it's civil, it's administrative, and uh, all the ladders and uh, uh, or the, even the hierarchy of remedies that we know, all right, provided for by the rules, uh, special rules, uh, and uh, even by substantive law, even by the constitution, uh, uh, even say uh, the time within which, the period within which a case should be decided once submitted for decision. Uh, which we know is more honored in the breach rather than uh, in its ob observance. So where is justice there? Okay, the old uh, saying, justice delayed is justice denied. Uh, so you see the imperfection of the system, uh, you know, you may have the most beautiful, uh, uh, exhausted, uh, uh, comprehensive uh, rules, all right? Borrowed from here, borrowed from there, studied by this, studied by that, and uh, it went through uh, the process, uh, deliberated upon by the Supreme Court, recommended by the UP Law Center, recommended by experts. And so we can have all those, ideally. But for as long as the system is manned by people who themselves have their imperfections, okay? Tamad, <laughs> corrupt, <laughs> and what else? <laughs> what will you have? Huh? You will have eventually a system uh, that in itself is errant as the lawyer, uh, uh, as the errant lawyer that it seeks to uh, prosecute or pursue the case against. Uh, how can that be fair? So that's why you have to go back. You have to go back to the off. That is to me very fundamental. Without the off no, in your heart, in your soul, all right, as you practice your profession, as you teach law, all right, as you serve your clients, pro bono or, you know, with the high, with the high, uh, uh, time billing, Ray, uh, time billing uh, that attorney did in 1988, uh, 1988, it took 10 years. Okay. Uh, it took 10 years, uh, 2008, 1998, but Malia Eight years, sir. Eight years. Uh, it took eight years before the Supreme Court has acted on it. Can you imagine that? 
Uh, no, I, I have been fortunate to be, you know, invited by the Supreme Court and so many committees. Uh, this committee, that committee, that committee, that we deliberate. Uh, sometimes we accelerate, sometimes stop. Uh, now we are deliberating on criminal procedure, uh, revision of the rules on criminal procedure. Uh, it has taken up uh, already two years. By the time that you know it comes out, we may have a changed situation. <laughs> Will the rules still be applicable by then? All right. So uh, the lawyers off. Thank you so much, and thank you for having me here. Thank God you, bless Professor. You. Thank you, Professor Ramon S. Esguera, for discussing the rules of the Commission on Bar Discipline. For those who want to ask questions, please put them in the chat box. There will be a plenary session after our next lecture, which will be Perspectives from Law Firms and Legal Practitioners by Professor Roberto Dio, who is currently the Secretary General of the Philippine Dispute Resolution Center, Inc., and editor of its publication, the Philippine ADR Review. He has lectured and written several articles on ADR, particularly negotiation, mediation, and arbitration. He is a member of the committees that revised the PDRCI arbitration rules and drafted the PDRCI mediation rules. He is a regular speaker on mediation and arbitration seminars of PDRCI, the Office for Alternative Dispute Resolution, Construction Industry Arbitration Commission. Lectures on ADR. Our litigation partner at the law firm of Castillo, Lamantan, Pantaleon, and San Jose, and sits in the board of trustees of PDRCI. Ladies and gentlemen, it's all welcome to talk on perspectives from law firms and legal practitioners, Professor Roberto Endia. Thank you, Thank you Armand. Um, good early noon to everyone, to all the participants and to my fellow panelists, especially my former partner, Attorney Ramon Sguera. That was a very good lecture, Mon, and I enjoyed it. But I would like to disabuse everyone's mind that <laughs> my time billings are quite expensive. <laughs> <You're not. laughs> uh, I would like to thank the UP College of Law for inviting me to, the, to today's webinar, uh, especially I was invited by Professor Emmer uh, Banyas, who was our former associate in the firm, and my former colleague in the UP College of Law faculty. Um, my talk today, can I have screen sharing please? I will be speaking this morning on three topics that are close to my heart, and I hope I will be able to do justice to the 30 minutes that was assigned to me. I will be talking on conflict of interest, legal aid, and practice of law. And I noticed earlier that uh, Professor Hardalesa already touched a little bit on practice of law. All right, so let me begin. Um, if you still remember uh, your legal ethics, and for me, this was a refresher when I was assigned to uh, speak at today's webinar. The attorney-client relation actually begins with this. It is deemed to exist when the lawyer voluntarily permits or acquiesces with the consultation of a person. So there must be some express consent or at least permission when we are consulted by a person who in respect to trouble So you can my wife invited us to lunch and then during lunch suddenly consulted me and then at the end of the consultation at the end of the lunch asked me to send an email confirming my advice. So what I did was when I sent the email I made it very clear that he was not my client. Okay, so no formality or written contract is required since the contract may be expressed or implied. It is sufficient that the advice and assistance of the attorney is sought and received in a manner pertinent to his profession. So you can see, beginning of the relationship is so easy on the part of the client, but 
on the part of the attorney, it is so difficult to terminate. Uh, in the case of Venteres versus Cosmo, the Supreme Court said that a client has the absolute right to terminate the attorney-client relation at any time, with or without cause. So parang ano to, this is like a divorce uh, with consent. Uh, with consent on the part of the wife or on the part of the husband, but without consent on the part of the other paid attorney's fees. So it's not the mere non-payment of our fees, but it should be deliberate. And the last is the lawyers elected or appointed to public office. And then other similar cases. right? So those are the uh, examples of good causes when a lawyer may voluntarily withdraw from an engagement. But under Rule 138, Section 26, a lawyer may retire from a litigation only by written consent of the client or without the consent of the client upon approval of the court. And the language used in the rule is that, quote, the court on notice of the client and attorney and on hearing determines that he ought to be allowed to retire, right? So we can see that the relation between the attorney and the client will remain as long as the parties consent. So this refers to current clients and until some event or circumstance that would terminate the relationship like death, insanity, and incapacity. Now, I would like the committee uh, in charge of revising the Code of Professional Responsibility to consider Rule 1.16b of the model ABA Rules of Professional Conduct, which was earlier referred to by Professor Hardelesa. The model rules, specifically Rule 1.16b, allows to add additional good causes for withdrawal. Uh, withdrawal can be accomplished without material adverse effect on the interest of the client. Uh, this will have to be de determined, of course. And then the second is the representation will result in an unreasonable financial burden on the lawyer or has been rendered unreasonably difficult by a client. Uh, itong second instance, uh, rendered unreasonably difficult by the client, actually happened to me. And uh, yung unreasonable financial burden also actually happened to the firm. The unreasonable financial burden will be encountered by US lawyers when you agree to a fee cap or when you agree to a fixed fee. Every time that happens, the tendency for the clients will be to, I'm not going to use the word abuse, but to use the retainer to a certain degree that eventually we pile up a lot of work and it becomes a losing proposition for the law firm. And then it's among unreasonably difficult. I, I once had a client, and this happened during the pandemic, where the client was practically mandating uh, telling the firm what to do with the case to the point that he was like uh, the partner in charge of, of the case. And uh, I think that happened because the client had a background in law. I think uh, the client went to law school uh, for first year. So it became unreasonably difficult that we had to terminate the relationship. Okay. Now, what is the nature of this attorney-client relation? So let's go back to what we have learned in law school. It is not merely contractual, it is also legal. Right? So we, when we enter into a relationship with the client, just be aware that we have legal obligations and duties. So these are the duties of confidentiality and conflict of interest that I will, that I am discussing right now. And then the second is contractual. Uh, it happens when we have an engagement letter or what's called in US law as non-engagement letter. All right. So what happens if uh, we now we understand the legal relationship and the contractual relationship between our current clients? But what happens to former clients? So again, let's take a look. We retain the duty of confidentiality to former clients, and this is seen in the CPR, in particular Rule 15.02. I just quoted only a few provisions. If you look at the entire provisions, there are a lot. So a lawyer shall be bound by the rule on privileged communication in respect of matters disclosed to him by a prospective client. So imagine prospective client pa lang ito. Okay, there is actually no relationship yet. Second, a lawyer shall not, to the disadvantage of his client, use information acquired in the course of employment, nor shall he use the same to his own advantage or that of a third person. 
unless the client with full knowledge of the circumstances consents thereto. There is an introduction of a third party. So it's not only for our purpose, but also for the benefit of a future client in third person. Again. Now, the second duty to former clients is the duty to avoid the conflict of interest. Again, we will take a look at the present provision of the Code of Professional Responsibility. Rule 15.01 states, a lawyer in conferring with a prospective client shall ascertain as soon as practicable whether the matter would involve a conflict with another client. It, the description of another client here covers current clients and former clients or his own interest, and if so, shall forthwith inform the prospective client. So here there is a duty of disclosure to the prospective client. And then the next rule, 15.03 states, a lawyer shall not represent conflicting interest except by written consent of all concerned, given after a full disclosure of the fact. So this is the principal rule on conflict of interest. That means we are not actually prohibited from representing con uh, conflicting interests but we have to comply with two requirements. Number one is full disclosure of the facts to both clients. And then second, written consent of all concerned. What does this mean? This means that we have to get the written consent of a former client. right? So you can see that it is becoming much more difficult as we go deep into our discussion. The next rule states, 15.04, a lawyer may, with the written consent of all concerned, act as mediator, conciliator, or arbitrator in settling disputes. This one is different. And I actually had the opportunity to act as mediator between two current clients who are involved in a dispute. Of course, I had to get the written consent. I built them both. And eventually, we were able to settle their dispute in six months. All right. Now, who are bound by the duty to clients? Um, this may surprise you, but when a client employs a law firm, the client engages the entire law firm. Hence, the resignation, retirement, or separation from the law firm of the handling lawyer does not terminate the relationship. And my basis here is Supreme Court decision in Malbar versus Kraft Food Philippines, Inc. Next, where a lawyer is disqualified from appearing as counsel in a case, and then when we say counsel in a case, we can also include here counsel in a project or in an engagement, anything. Because of conflict of interest with the law firm of which he is a member. So that means a member, member, or when we say member, member of the professional partnerships, that means a partner. Any member, associate or assistant is similarly disqualified or prohibited from so acting. You can see the prohibition or the limitation by reason of conflict of interest actually trickles down all the way to the associate or even the assistant. I don't know what this, the meaning of assistant is. Probably it refers to an underbar associate. And here again, I'm citing a Supreme Court decision, Blandina Hilado versus Levin. Now, in reality, our duty to avoid the conflict of interest to clients remains in perpetuity. Right? So we can see from Canon 21, a lawyer shall preserve the confidence and secrets of his client even after the attorney-client relation is terminated. So that's very clear. Even after the termination of the relationship, according to the Supreme Court, the lawyer is not justified in representing an interest adverse to or in conflict with the former client. So it's all very clear. Former client, we have terminated the relationship with that client. Because the client's confidence cannot be divested by the mere termination of professional engagement. So this is the reason why I emphasized uh, in the earlier slide that the relationship between the attorney and the client is not merely contractual. It is also legal. So this is one example uh, whereby the relationship is determined by law or by existing rules. Now I go to the basis of my uh, statement at the top of the slide, that the conflict of interest remains with us as a duty in perpetuity. So according to the su Supreme Court in this case, the rule prohibiting conflict of interest was fashioned to prevent situations wherein the lawyer would be representing a client whose interest is directly adverse to any of his present 
or former clients. Imagine, in the same way, a lawyer may only be allowed to represent a client involving the same or substantially related matter that is materially adverse to the former client only if the former client consents to it after consultation. So imagine the burden on us. The rule is grounded in the fiduciary obligation of loyalty. So how can we be loyal to a former client? The former client is no longer paying us on retainer. All right. Throughout the course of a lawyer-client relationship, the lawyer learns all the facts connected with the client's case. So this is the assumption, including the weak and strong points of the case. Knowledge and information gathered in the course of the relationship must be treated as sacred and guarded with care. It behooves lawyers not only to keep inviolate the client's confidence, but also to avoid the appearance of treachery and double dealing. For only then can litigants be encouraged to entrust their secrets to their lawyers, which is paramount in the administration of justice. The nature of that relationship is, therefore, one of trust and confidence of the highest degree. All right, let's go to the second part of uh, that quotation. Canon 17 of the CPR provides that the lawyer owes fidelity to the cause of his client and shall be mindful of the trust and confidence imposed on him. His highest and most unquestioned duty is to protect the client at all hazards and costs, even to himself. Now, ito na yung because this protection is perpetual and does not cease with the termination of the litigation, nor is it affected by the party ceasing to employ the attorney and detaining another or by any other change of relation between them. It even survives the death of the client. That is the case of Tulio versus Bohangin. So this is a reminder to everyone that at present, unless we modify uh, the CPR to limit this, that is the status of our duty of conflict of interest to our former clients. Now, there are four tests to see if there is a conflict of interest. And again, this, is, this came from a case. If acceptance of a new relation will prevent an attorney from full discharge of duty of undivided fidelity and loyalty to the client, or invite suspicion of unfaithfulness or double dealing. So you can see here, the key word is suspicion. So that means it's in the eyes of the client. If the client will suspect that we are not uh, loyal to him or to her, then that means in our minds, we should we have a conflict of interest and therefore we should decline the new engagement. Second, if acceptance of the new retainer will require the attorney to do an act that will injure the first client, in any matter in which the attorney represented the client. So ito, here there is uh, a consequence of the new engagement. There must be actual injury. The third, if the attorney will be called upon in the new relation to use against the first client any knowledge acquired through their connection. So that, that, that means any secrets that were confided to us uh, can be used ag against the former client and in favor of the new client. And then the last, if on behalf of one client, it is the lawyer's duty to fight for an issue or claim, but it is also a duty to, to oppose it for the other client. So this is a clear case of conflict of interest. So the source is for Nilia versus Saluna. Right. So what are the consequences if we have a conflict of interest and we don't mind these rules? These are, again, just a reminder uh, to everyone, as discussed by Professor Esguera, we can be disbarred or we can be suspended from the practice of law. But more than that, we can become criminally liable under Article 209 of the Revised Penal Code for betrayal of trust and revelation of secrets. It says, any attorney at law who, by any malicious breach of professional duty or of inexcusable negligence or ignorance, imagine even ignorance, shall prejudice his client or reveal any of the secrets of the latter learned by him in his professional capacity, shall suffer the penalty of prison correctional in its minimum period or a fine ranging from 40,000 to 200,000 pesos or both. Right? So in prison correctional in its minimum period, I'm not very sure of that. Uh, maybe it's two years, but prison correctional is six years. The same penalty shall be imposed upon an attorney at law who having undertaken the defense of a client or having received confidential information from said client in the case, shall undertake the defense of the opposing party in the same case without the consent of his first client. Okay. 
Now, it seems so easy, di ba? Uh, for us to understand, well, uh, you're a lawyer, you knew very well all of this. You have been practicing for a long time. In my case, I've been in practice for 37 years. But uh, is it that easy? It's not really that easy. I'm going to cite just one example of how unfair the rule is. Let's imagine that, uh, just like in the case of Professor Sierra, although I'm not directly using him as an example, I would like to use an example, by way of example, the leading litigator in the Philippines, Titong Mendoza. Uh, I remember him because I'm currently working with him. So Titong Mendoza was a former government attorney, hindi ba? Uh, he was the former, he was a former governor of Pampanga. He was a former assemblyman in the Bata Asam Pambansa. He was a former minister of justice and he was a former solicitor general. So if I'm going to ask you the question, who was his client during all of those times? His client was the government. But the moment he ceased his involvement with the government, he began handling cases against the government. So is there a conflict of interest? Difficult question, but someone forgot uh, to take that into consideration. And then if we are working in a, in a firm just like us, how many clients can we really uh, handle uh, in the course of our practice? Sooner or later, we will be involved in a conflict of interest. There are not too many clients in the Philippines. Our economy is not as big as that of the US. Right? So probably in uh, a course of in my case, in a course of one year, uh, I would discover that when I make uh, a conflict of interest uh, query with my partners, there would always be at least siguro mga two or three uh, where I will realize that we are in, in a situation of conflict of interest. So I would like to propose to the committee that they consider changes in the Code of Professional Responsibility to limit the conflict of interest. How do we do this? These are just suggestions, just ideas that I will float. Number one is by contract. How do we do it? The lawyer shall retain the discretion to determine if there is conflict of interest. Right? So we, we have a duty of loyalty to the client and even to former clients. Maybe the person who would be the first to determine that should be the lawyer. And that should be stated in the contract, among others. The second is the nature of the subject matter that we will consulted on. If it's a matter uh, that I was consulted on, then naturally I will have a conflict if another client, a prospective client, would consult me on a related matter. Diba? But if it's an unrelated matter, then maybe I should not be conflicted. All right? But this thing will have to be determined by the committee and by the Supreme Court in the revision of the CPR, it cannot be stated in the contract. Because as I said, uh, the nature of our relationship with our clients is not contractual alone, it is also legal. Another suggestion that I have in mind, and this bears uh, on my practice as an ADR uh, professional, is time limit. Maybe it's possible for us to adopt the same guidelines that the International Bar Association in its guidelines on conflict of interest in international arbitration of three years. What well, that means if we have been engaged by a former client three years ago, then after three years, we may no longer be in a situation of conflict of interest, especially nowadays when information just keeps on changing by the minute. But again, this is just a consideration instead of being in a perpetual state of conflict of interest. And then the, ne the next one is a duty of disclosure to the new client and divide the, this one is already existing. Just notice to the former client, All right? So we don't have to get the consent, just notice. What do I mean? Well, if you former client really think that we are conflicted, then you should object, which is my uh, next point, there should be a duty to object by the client within a certain period of time, failure to comply with which means a waiver of the duty of conflict of interest by the attorney. All right, so the waiver will, will follow uh, if after five days from notice, the former client or the current client does not object 
to the new relation. And then the last suggestion is you're familiar with this, uh, especially in the case of uh, Professors Guerra and uh, the members of the committee, the infamous Chinese wall. Uh, for those who are not familiar with this, the Chinese wall happened, uh, I think this was a development in finance in the US be because financial consultants were having a problem just like us uh, because they were being approached by the same clients who may have opposing interests on both sides of the transaction. One may be the creditor, the other one may be the debtor. So what do we do? Uh, since our firm, I imagine that, imagine lang that I'm a big firm in the US and uh, our firm is known for this, uh, for project finance. So naturally we, we are in a niche practice, maybe we're engaged in tax. Uh, we are in a niche practice and uh, almost all of the clients who will need tax advice or project finance advice would go to us. So as a result of this, the Chinese wall was invented and eventually it was affirmed as a valid way of avoiding conflict of interest. It is an arbitrary, it is an artificial uh, barrier to information between two teams in the same firm. But in the absence of any recognition that this is valid under Philippine law, then we cannot apply it strictly, diba? We still need to get the written consent of both clients for the Chinese wall uh, to be practiced to avoid the conflict of interest. Okay, so let's go to the next uh, topic close to my heart. I spent six years, um, part of it with Dean Carlo Bustan in the Office of Legal Aid in the UP College of Law. So I went on leave uh, approximately two years ago. So um, I experienced uh, the rare privilege of engaging in indigent litigation as a way of giving back to the community. And I can assure you, it is very fulfilling. Now, uh, there is really a need for lawyers in the active practice of law, or even those uh, who are not in the active practice of law, but uh, maintaining their license as lawyers to do legal aid. But what is the status of legal aid in the Philippines? First, in 2009, we have the Mandatory Legal Aid Service of Practicing Lawyers, or MLAS. This was a program of the Supreme Court. The requirement was to render a minimum 60 hours of free legal aid services to indigent litigants in a year, spread over 12 months and with a minimum of five hours of free legal aid service each month. But the last time we checked with the Supreme Court, the project or the program was suspended. The next program, uh, which was enacted in 2017, just before the pandemic, was the Rule on Community Legal Aid Service. And in uh, UP Ola, we discussed this uh, very well because I think uh, we got credit for the hours that we spent in UP Ola. For new lawyers in 2018 and 2019, a minimum of 120 hours of free legal aid service within one year from admission to the bar, counted from the date of signing of the role of attorneys. Again, what is the status of this program? It was suspended. Now we have a law. RA 9999 or the Free Legal Assistance Act of 2010. This law uh, gives uh, lawyers or professional partnerships rendering actual free legal service to an incentive, uh, it gives them an incentive. They shall be entitled to an allowable deduction from the gross income equivalent to the value of the free legal service rendered or up to 10% of the gross income derived from the actual performance of the legal profession, whichever is lower. What is the status of this law? It is not implemented because the BIR, I think, has not come out with the implementing rules and regulations. Sayang, hindi ba? Attorney Bagilat uh, discussed very well uh, the phenomenon of the tulpo justice. Why is there such a thing like that? Well, apart from its entertainment value, people are hungry really for justice. And if a person who is earning 14,000 pesos a month as salary uh, is going to consult a lawyer, how can that person afford the services of attorneys like us? Diba? Uh, they can definitely afford my services because we have a pro bono uh, legal service program in the firm. Uh, but what about ordinary lawyers who are not really earning so much? Sabihin natin, ang kinikita niya sa solo practice niya is about 100,000 a month. So how can 
can that lawyer be able to do this? Di ba? Respond to the need for real justice. All right? So there is really a need to amend uh, the CPR to allow for pro bono practice. All right? So I don't know how it's going to be done, but these are some ideas that I would like to suggest to the committee. One is through indigent litigation, either through uh, the Office of Legal Aid or similar legal aid pro programs of law schools. So maybe that's possible, I'm not sure, but indigent litigation, based on my own experience, is very productive. You know, the banting average of the U UP Office of Legal Aid is very high uh, in case of settlement and in case of cases won. I think it's very close to 80 to 90%. So if indigent litigation is very successful in the case of the UP College of Law, why not uh, encourage it uh, with the IBP, for instance, uh, with the law schools, with other institutions? So that means we need to set up an office of legal aid where people can walk in and then avail of voluntary legal services. The other one, which is a program of the IBP in partnership with PDRCI, is pro bono ADR. This will involve matters. The way we projected it is this will involve disputes uh, that do not exceed 5 million pesos. So may pagka-commercial, di ba? So it is pro bono because the services of the arbitrator or the mediator will be completely free. And then uh, there will be no need, of course, to pay anything to the IBP if we have this pro bono ADR. This can be handled also by the law schools. This can be handled by PDRCI. But we need the support of the Supreme Court and uh, maybe through the CPR because we need to get credit. If we lawyers are required to do legal aid, uh, we need to be credited for the actual hours that we do. Because, you know, I discovered it. Unless lawyers are earning sufficiently, they won't be in a position to provide pro bono legal services. So, it's an irony, hindi ba? Unless someone is paying for our pro bono services, we cannot provide it free of charge. Otherwise, our families will have a problem, hindi ba? So, that's, that's another, that's uh, one suggestion. The other one is court duty and assistance. We are quite familiar with the court backlogs. Uh, Professor Sgera mentioned the backlog with the IBP. That's not surprising because in the case, in my own experience, if I file a case with the trial courts, when I, when I am asked by the clients, what is the estimated time when the litigation in trial court will be terminated? What I usually give them is three to five years because that's my own experience. Is it possible for us to shorten this to one year? The answer is yes. Uh, by applying the uh, duty of uh, lawyers to provide legal aid to actual court duty and assistance. How are we going to do it? Of course, we cannot act as a judge, diba? but we can be appointed as commissioners. Diba, ano ba ang trabaho ng commissioner? Basically, to go over the record, especially when uh, the evidence involves complicated accounting matters, mga ganyan, computations, etc. We can actually conduct the hearing. But we can also be a commissioner in the sense that we can go over the transcripts, the offers of uh, documentary evidence, and prepare a summary of the findings of fact. How long will, will that work require? It depends on the complexity of the case. But the time that we render there will be equivalent to the legal aid service that we will perform. How are we going to have access to the court record that will have to be determined by the committee? And when I say assistance, what about drafting the decision or the judgment on the merits, diba? And this can be done on a blind basis, all right? We will give you the summary of facts uh, prepared by volunteer lawyer A, and then we will give you the memorandum or the memoranda submitted by the parties, but on a blind basis. And then you as volunteer B will prepare the draft uh, decision. It will not be binding on the court, but the court will have the opportunity to peruse it, maybe cite it, and maybe adapt it in photo. Diba? All right. So if we combine that with our improvements and enhancements in the way trial is being conducted in civil and criminal cases, it 
is really possible for us to shorten the litigation period to just one year. And so I mentioned that already, the commissioners. Another uh, development uh, that I would like to suggest is legal internships. Okay, so what is legal internship? Well, part of legal education, uh, at least in the UP College of Law, is legal internship in the uh, Office of Legal Aid. And now I think we have legal externships. This was developed during the time of Dean Danny Concepcion before he was appointed as uh, president of UP. Uh, the law students in their senior year can be assigned as externs to law firms. So this can be made a requirement uh, for all law firms and for all law schools to develop a system of legal internships. Um, so that will result, and probably if we are going to couple this with the requirement that all law firms should have pro bono desk or pro bono services, then legal interns can really be assigned to this pro, pro bono desk or pro bono offices. Okay, and then we can also conduct pro bono legal clinics. I don't, well, what do I mean by this? We can go out either as a part of IBP uh, or, or any other institution like PDR saying conduct legal clinics to educate the people on their rights and obligations and then probably uh, give them consultations on a blind basis on their legal problems. Diba? So those are just a few of the ideas that we can, uh, that I'm floating to the committee and perhaps the committee can consider in uh, revising and updating the CPR. Now let's go to the last topic, which is close to my heart, and this pertains to the practice of law. We are all familiar uh, with the case of Cayetano versus Monsod, uh, decided in 1991, which practically redefined the practice of law. And I'm just quoting one of the many legal definitions in this case. And I think uh, this is what is being taught to our law students. The practice of law refers to any activity in or out of court, which requires the application of law, legal procedure, knowledge, training, and experience. I am highlighting uh, in red font, legal knowledge, training, and experience. So what is Mr. Tulfo and his team doing? They're actually very close to practicing law because in certain instances, the host would mention uh, that what you are doing or what the uh, person you're complaining against is doing is violation of law, et cetera, et cetera. And then maybe the police officer will be called uh, and then, you know, will be berated and will be told that, you know, this is your duty, blah, blah, blah. I don't know if Mr. Tulfo has a legal background but among his uh, team or among his staff uh, are lawyers. Uh, so uh, what is he doing, right? It is to give notice or render any kind of service which device or service requires the use in any degree of legal knowledge or skill, All right? So that it is, that, that's it. Now, what is the nature of the legal license that is given to us? This is a little bit sobering because we in uh, law firms are focused on the budget, but we are constantly reminded by the Supreme Court uh, that the practice of law is not a business. It is a profession. So it is a privilege. We are given the opportunity after we are licensed by the Supreme Court to use our legal knowledge and skill uh, to render service to the public. So here, what is being uh, emphasized by the Supreme Court is the duty of public service, not money, is the primary consideration. Of course, we need to support the law firm members and associates, pay their salaries, etc. But that is a secondary consideration. The primary consideration is performing a duty to the public, right? So that is the nature of our uh, duty as lawyers. In this case, the role of the corporate counsel was discussed, okay? Because uh, as you can see from the lawyer's oath that was read to us by Professor Sguera, the focus is 90% litigation. It was written uh, during a time when there were probably little or no corporate practice. But uh, as you can see, and this happened, I think, after martial law, beginning with the opening of the economy and then uh, uh, with the coming in of foreign investment, we began to have uh, opportunities 
to work with foreign lawyers, uh, to handle foreign clients, and to be involved in international disputes. So the emergence of the Corporate Council happened uh, in the 80s and continues up to now. Something which was never envisioned by the framers or the writers of the original lawyer's oath. According to the court in Cayetano, a corporate lawyer, and this was quoted from, I think, an article published in Business World. I don't remember now the author, but one of the quotations that referred to attorney Ricardo Romulo, the Romulo law firm. A corporate lawyer is a lawyer who handles the legal affairs of a corporation. These areas of concern may include corporate legal research, tax laws, acting as corporate secretary in board meetings, appearances in both courts, and other adjudicatory agencies, including the SEC, and in other capacities which require an ability to deal with the law. A corporate lawyer may assume responsibilities other than the legal affairs of the business of the corporation he is representing. This includes such matters as determining policy and becoming involved in management. And this is true. Uh, publicly listed companies are now required to have a chief compliance officer. And many of these chief compliance officers are lawyers. Uh, they are required to have independent directors. And almost all of these independent directors are lawyers. So lawyers are becoming involved in management. A corporate lawyer services may sometimes be engaged by a multinational. Some large MNCs provide one of the few opportunities available to corporate lawyers to enter the international law field. After all, international law is practiced in a relatively small number of companies and law firms. So ito, this one is growing. Uh, we are now uh, faced with the phenomenon of cross-border transactions happening all the time. All right, so are we prepared for this when our uh, lawyer's oath is focused 90% on litigation? And if, even if you look at the Code of Professional Responsibility, there are only a few provisions there that can really be applicable to the role of a corporate counsel. And so finally, and this is my last quotation from this case, the general counsel has emerged in the last decade as one of the most vibrant subsets of the legal profession. In fact, it is, it is growing. Uh, corporate law firms used to be centered in uh, Makati, and then later on, they migrated to BGC, and then later on to Ortigas. Now we have corporate law firms in Quezon City, uh, in Caloocan and in all other areas of the NCR, and even in uh, the regions like Cebu, Cagayan de Oro, Davao City, uh, Iloilo, etc. The Corporate Council, uh, here in Makalagay Dito, but I guess this is there, bears responsibility for key aspects of the firm's strategic issues or strategic issues, including structuring global operations managing improved relationships with an increasingly diversified body of employees, managing expanded liability exposure, it being risk management, creating new and varied interactions with public decision makers. So they have liaison uh, work with Congress, uh, with the executive department, and even with the courts, coping internally with more complex make or buy decisions. So you can see uh, it's a combination of management role and the role of a lawyer. So that is the current reality. Is this now reflected in the CPR? No, it's not. So we have to redefine the practice of law. And these are just a few ideas that I have in mind. Number one is to update the CPR to conform to Cayetano versus Monsot. That was 1991, all right? Uh, our revised rules of court, which embodied the first code of professional responsibility, was enacted or became effective on January 1, 1964, a long, long time ago. The Code of Professional Responsibility, as reminded to us by uh, Professor Hardelessa, was approved by the Supreme Court and became effective on June 1, 1988, or 34 years ago. Tagal na, hindi ba? That's more than a generation. So it's really timely uh, to update the CPR. But if it will take another eight years or a decade for the new CPR to be approved by the Supreme Court, then maybe the committee members should be more forward-looking uh, and anticipate this possible delay. Okay, the second is law partnerships. I have nothing against uh, law firms masquerading as partnerships, but we have a proliferation of law firms, Kuno, 
in quotation that are not actually registered partnerships. Ano ang result? We don't know what kind of animal they are, especially in-house law firms. You will see a, uh, an enumeration, a list of names, attorneys A, B, C, D, E. Are they really a partnership? Because there are only two ways of practicing law here in the Philippines. One is solo. The other one is through a firm, which is through a professional partnership. Then why do we have those? And then how do we deal with law firms in government corporate offices, uh, in government corporations? Ano ang papano sila? So there is nothing in the CPR. There is nothing under the law. There is nothing in jurisprudence to govern their relationships. Let's go back to the conflict of uh, interest situation. Let's imagine I'm a government corporate counsel in the OGCC. What happens if I leave uh, that office? Will the rules on uh, law firms apply to me? Right? So, hindi masagot yan. So, I'm just suggesting that the CPR maybe can be amended so that it can become, so that we can have a clear rule that will apply for firms that are that look like uh, partnerships, but not in reality partnerships, and those who are in uh, public service as government attorneys. And then another idea that we can consider uh, is registering foreign attorneys. This is a hot issue because uh, there was a move uh, to uh, allow foreign lawyers to practice in the Philippines. And uh, one law firm I know is very interested in this. And that's cutie, Isumbing Torres, because they happen to be uh, affiliated with a uh, big law firm, Baker and McKenzie. But uh, if we look at other jurisdictions like Japan, Singapore, Hong Kong, uh, and Korea, they have registered foreign attorneys. I cited those Asian countries because we are in Asia. I don't know what's happening in other jurisdictions. In the US, they don't have this. They have foreign lawyers but they are not practicing as foreign lawyers. They are working basically as associates in a firm. So what can registered foreign lawyers or foreign attorneys do in the Philippine context? They can handle international law. Philippine law will still be practiced by Philippine lawyers, so there is no reason for us to be worried about that. But if we have registered foreign attorneys, imagine how vibrant uh, the practice of law in the Philippines will be. Diba? Can you imagine, uh, for instance, in the law firm of uh, Bless Law, where uh, Professor uh, Esguer is a managing partner, he will have Koreans, Japanese, Singaporeans, Hong Kong lawyers as registered foreign attorneys. In our firm, we can also have the same. And any result known, we will have referrals coming from international clients, and our lawyers will be exposed to international practice. What is happening right now is we, will, we are just doing basically what we are doing now, which is, which is what? We are inbreeding. And you know what happens when we are inbreeding? Diba? Mutations happen. <laughs> so it's endless. Uh, the development of our law is not uh, at par with developments uh, internationally. Uh, and I experienced that in the case of ADR. Right? So... Uh, I'm being signaled to end my, my part. So, sige. So, the last that I will be talking on is artificial intelligence in law practice. This was mentioned earlier, I think, by Professor Hardalesa. Just very quick. Uh, I have a copy with me of the ABA, or American Bar Association Litigation News. And uh, there was a recent decision in Florida by the Florida Supreme Court uh, barring the use of application-based legal assistance uh, because it amounts to practice, unauthorized practice of law. The case is Florida Bar versus TIKD Services LLC or Limited Liability uh, Corporation. I will just read very briefly the facts. The defendants, a Florida-based limited liability company and its CEO, operated a website and mobile application that provided assistance to drivers who received traffic tickets. A driver could create an account on the defendant's website, agree to the defendant's terms of service, and upload a picture of his or her ticket. The defendants would review the ticket and determine whether they should provide any services to the driver. The terms of service included authorization for the defendants to hire and pay for counsel on a flat fee basis 
regardless of the outcome of the case. If the defendants accepted the ticket, they would charge the driver a percentage of the ticket's value and send the driver's information to a licensed attorney with whom the defendants contracted to provide traffic ticket defense to their customers. Drivers could reject an attorney's representation, however, and vice versa. If the driver chose to accept representation, the attorney would communicate directly with the driver and handle all aspects of the driver's defense. So it's on the basis of that, the Florida Supreme Court a rule that that is an unauthorized practice of law. But we should have something uh, to guide uh, lawyers uh, in the CPR when that happens, right? So with that, I would like to uh, end my short lecture and go back to the webinar for the open forum. Thank you, Professor Dio for your uh, perspectives from the law practice. There is a question here. With the proliferation of multidisciplinary professional services firms, most of which offering services that can be classified as legal services and are covered by our definition of practice of law, are lawyers employed or even work as partners principals in this MDP firms considered to be engaged in or allowing an authorized practice of law? Uh, well, that I cannot answer. Only the Supreme Court can, can do that. Uh, the questioner is basically referring to paralegal services. Right? And I think uh, we should encourage these paralegal services. But I think personally, for as long as there is no advice given, uh, which will involve... Uh, determination of the rights and obligations of the party asking, then I think uh, we can safely say that they are not engaged in the unauthorized practice of law. If the service relates only, for instance, to uh, getting a clearance from the office of the uh, clerk of court, or uh, maybe getting a certified two copy uh, of a certain document, or even paying taxes, I don't think that amounts to unauthorized practice of law. But that is maybe. Okay. Uh, thank you, Professor Dio. There's actually no other question here in our question and answer box. This point. Then I uh, just like to remind the participants that uh, for those who would want to secure a certification for their participation or for their attendance in this uh, symposium, please answer the evaluation form, the bit.ly link of which was uh, posted in the chat box. Okay, uh, in the absence of any other question, I'd like to close today's uh, program for this morning. There will be another uh, part two of this uh, symposium on the proposed revisions to code professional responsibility. This will be the lightning talks to be given by the uh, students of the UP College of Law. <clears throat> that will be at one o'clock, one o'clock to 5 p.m. I'd like to thank our lecturers, Professor Hardelesa, Attorney Bagilat, Professor Esguera, and Professor Dio for their uh, discussions and their respective uh, topics. And I'd like to thank the, uh, those who attended today's uh, session for uh, your contributions also. I'd also like to thank uh, the, uh, our director as well as uh, Dean Vistan for their participation this morning. All right, uh, it's almost 12. Let's meet again at one o'clock. Thank you, thank you to everyone. Thank you. Thank everyone. you. Thank you. Thank you.